Nottingham School Committee meeting of June 4th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, first item on the agenda is item 2.1 to approve minutes of the school committee meeting held on May 7th. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on May 7th, 2018. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Carrie. Any discussion? I do have discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to note in section four under the comments that I should be referred to as the vice chair and not the chair. Um, Thank you for catching that. But that's, that that's it. So I guess I would make a motion to approve the amended minutes of, <laughs> um, unless someone else had anything else on the minutes. Anybody else? So second of the amended. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Minutes are approved. All right. Um, agenda item number three, questions and comments. I believe we have someone tonight, so I will just quickly read this. Uh, comments are always welcome as agenda items are discussed. We have set aside time in the agenda to enable members of the audience to raise questions or make comments on any matters of general concern. Your limited, uh, sorry, individual speakers are limited to three minutes. Be reminded that um, meetings are televised and we ask that you respect the privacy of others. So. Thank you, Madam Chairman. You're welcome. Uh, and other school committee member meeting, minutes, excuse me, members. Uh, my name is Al Chambers. I live at the Lincoln School and uh, in one of my old classrooms. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I came here tonight to uh, ask you to participate in something that I think might have great significance for the committee and the parents of chil uh, children who are students here in Hingham. Uh, I've been active in the Hingham Police Alumni Association for a long period of time. It was started by uh, Steve Carlson, who I hope most of you remember. He's a wonderful guy. And it's been a form of community uh, relations within the town to uh, present issues that the police need help on. Um, l earlier this year, the FBI released a very detailed organizational plan for the response to a school shooting. The name of the film is called uh, uh, The Coming Storm. And it is one fascinating film. And uh, it preceded, by the way, the Parkland uh, incident, and yet it's almost exactly what happened. Same amount of students, same size high school, et cetera, et cetera. The, uh, our police have been well trained in how to react to this. And of course, nobody wants to see it happen. But uh, they had then done their own video, which was filmed up at the uh, new middle school on how to react to uh, 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 a, a shooter in the uh, building. And it is also fa fabulous to watch. It's graphic, it's tough, but it's worth seeing. And so I want to, we are planning when I say we, I don't have a group, by the way. I suggested that we have uh, a presentation of this made to more people. We had it done last month uh, to the men's breakfast uh, down in the uh, uh, senior center. And uh, it was so interesting that people would not leave. They asked the officer to stay behind. They went to another room and continued. Uh, what I'd like to do in conjunction with uh, the Republicans who are willing to sponsor it and the Hingham police is I'd like to redo the whole thing in a larger venue. And we're thinking of doing it in August, prior to school starting and after school that's out in spring, of course. And I think we may get a very, very large response to it. So I'm asking, I think it would be suitable to be mentioned to your PTA groups or other, um, other uh, parents here in Hingham that have students in the school. Uh, we may need your help in terms of possibly the high school uh, uh, auditorium. We uh, considered Sanborn. We know we can get uh, the, the two big um, conference rooms on the third floor here. 
but we're not sure how much of a uh, response we'll get. I would bet it will be big. Okay, we're going to advertise it. And so that's why I'm here. Uh, happy to answer any questions. But this is a program that many parents here in Hingham want to get a good look at, and they will be impressed by the preparation of our police. So much. Thank you. Do, do folks have questions for Mr. Chambers? Um, I guess I have a question. So this movie was produced by the Hingham Police Department? Uh, there are two videos. Okay. One is the FBI video, okay. which is very professional. And that's the uh, strategy okay. of how to handle it. And then the second video was done at the middle school during the training up there. And it's, it, it's, for me, it brought it to life because I knew the people doing the job and the fire was there, and paramedics and uh, other response teams. And it was, uh, uh, I was proud of it. It's a good job. And this would be, the audience would be um, adults, not for we d Yeah, say, we okay. do not want, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it may be a little too graphic. Hmm? You plan to show both videos? Yes. And uh, the police will be there to answer questions. All set? Mm -hmm. uh, I I are, are these videos available to look at yeah. uh, just online or on YouTube or anything? I, I don't know whether it is or not. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's online. Okay. You could ask at the police station okay. downstairs and they might let you take it. Okay. All right. Thank uh, you. Carrie, I had the same question. I yeah. guess I. Before we promoted anything, I would want to make sure, I personally would want to have seen it so that I would know how we're communicating the message. I, I understand the message, but you know, for us to participate, and I'd want to be knowledgeable about what it was, so I just okay. would want to preview it I'm prior sure that to would be fine sharing the communication. So as I understand it, the coming, um, it's called The Coming Storm is online to see. Oh, okay. Oh, is it really? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. So, okay. Uh, but the uh, not the I, police. not the second one. Yeah. I would suggest uh, that uh, John has a task force this year, the Safety and Security yep. Task Force. It's made up of uh, members of our staff, but also um, members of the Hingham Police Department, including Glenn, and they've been working all yep. year. One of the things they're doing is updating our uh, our plan um, that. Um, uh, should totally being redone, yeah. and that perhaps uh, John might get together with um, Glenn as to you know how this fits in. That would be my only concern. Are we sending one message, and yep. and the video may be another message, mm -hmm. albeit to different audiences? So, so if John can get together with Glenn and talk about um, how it fits with the mission, because Glenn is on the committee, mm -hmm. um, that might be a way of uh, his sharing. If the one video is on online and accessible, then the other one, the local one, uh, Glenn and John could arrange for it to be viewed by, you know, whomever among the uh, school committee staff would like to see it. Makes would sense. that work out, Al? Did you ask me a question? Yeah, I asked if it would work uh, well for your purpose if John and Glenn can well, get together about the local video. And yeah. be sure it's consistent with the message we're Absolutely sending out. Absolutely fine with me. And uh, and and allow them. It. <laughs> it's just something I think we should make aware to citizens. Mm -hmm. Good. And I think they will be impressed. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other comments or questions from the audience? All right. Uh, thank you. Then we will move on to item four, superintendent's report. Thank you. So um, we've had a number of uh, events and activities lately, and I'm not going to comment on the on the uh, high school one per se or graduation because I'm sure between you and uh, <laughs> and Emma that we'll get a full uh, full read up about that. 
I do want to talk a bit about the Memorial Day activities that happened in several of our schools and also that happened in this building a week ago, a week ago Monday, and, and let you know that uh, we got several emails and letters about the elementary presentations from a couple of the veterans, and uh, so those are always nice to see and hear. Um, and there is one in particular that I will share with you that uh, was written by Dave Sargent, who is a, a member of the local veterans groups and very complimentary. He had uh, attended the event at the Plymouth River School and spoke with quite a lot of passion about seeing very young kids and the red, white, and blue and the, and the handmade decorations and so on and what they're learning at such an early age. The event here was very well attended. I'm always proud of uh, how we celebrate those kinds of events in our town. And while we may disagree about a lot of things, we don't disagree about uh, the need for respect for our, for our veterans and what they provided for us. But Hingham High School was particularly well represented on that day. Our band um, with Brian Sincotta was there. Again, they're there every year. And you know, kids give up their time on a, on a holiday to come here and be part of the celebration. Uh, we had a student who sang the um, national anthem at the beginning of the ceremony. In addition to the band, we had uh, members of the Veterans Appreciation Club who read the proclamation from the governor on that day. Subsequent to the event, um, there was a luncheon for the veterans at GAR Hall and the Veterans Appreciation Club students uh, went there and assisted with uh, everybody getting in and getting fed with the buffet and so on. And then they went on to a ceremony comparable to the one in our auditorium up at Linden Ponds. They have a large number of veterans who live there and they have their own Memorial Day and Veterans Day celebrations and uh, our students went there as well. So, you know, nice to see so many youngsters that really were uh, participating at the elementary level and being a formal part of the ceremony as they are every year at the, uh, at the auditorium here. So I did want to mention that there are lots of other things going on in the elementary schools, the end of year concerts and uh, the fifth grade. I don't like to call them graduations. I like to call them celebrations, uh, recognitions or whatever. To me, there's only one graduation, but in any event, all of those events are, uh, are coming up and well planned and are always uh, are done very well and particularly uh, give a, a thanks to the parents in our community who provide so much for our kids and uh, at the elementary schools in particular this is the time of year when they provide uh, remembrances and a wonderful ceremony a little different in each building um, but they are crucial to to our partnership and and uh, we would be remiss in not recognizing that um, more to the point for tonight I want to introduce uh, Suzanne Venice so Suzanne, stand up. Maybe you'd like to come to the microphone. Suzanne is uh, a newly appointed uh, student services director. <laughs> and uh, we had, uh, many of you know, a very comprehensive search and um, lots of opportunity for Suzanne to meet with, uh, uh, with, with folks in our community, parents and staff members, and uh, to take tour of our buildings and so on. Suzanne, Suzanne has been here a couple times since then. Uh, most of you know she is the uh, coordinator of special education at Brookline High School, so is coming here as our director of special ed. And Suzanne and I have talked on a couple of occasions about a contract, and we're pretty close. Uh, we have some verbal agreement, but pretty close to getting our documents all in line and uh, to get those, um, those signed. And as well, we're um, having some beginning conversations about a transition and numbers of different individuals and groups that Suzanne will need to meet with uh, along the way. So, welcome to Hingham. Thank you. And Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah. I've said uh, several times that each time Suzanne comes here, she seems even more excited about coming. And we <laughs> it's the truth. More <laughs> excited yeah. about having her arrive. So, it's the uh, truth. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll continue with our, with our plans, yeah. but we wanted you and the audience at home to be able to say hello if you haven't met Suzanne before. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you so Thank you for having me. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have anything else, Tom? Um, 
No, I think uh, I think not, but I know that you had wanted to give some thanks. I did. Um, I had a bunch of thank yous to give. I gave some of them at the graduation the other day, but in particular, I wanted to thank the Hingham Rec Department for hosting the class of 2018 at their senior picnic. Um, May 24th it was a beautiful day. Um, thank the school department for, for providing some of the food for the graduates or the soon to be graduates. They had a great picnic sort of field day outside, but it was great. Um, and also a huge shout out to the maintenance um, crew that helped us all day long. They were amazing. I cannot say enough about how much support the maintenance and custodial staff gives to all these events that Dodd was mentioning that happened not only at the end of the year, but all throughout the year. Um, it was great. And then um, of course, graduation was lovely. Um, I heard great things from parents. Carlos and I both had graduates, so it was particularly touching. Um, but um, it was just a great ceremony. Everybody commented on how, how nice of a ceremony it was. Um, and senior night went off without a hitch. The graduates, 275 of them, um, had a big overnight party at the high school, and it was very well attended, so 275 out of a class of two, no, 327. 327, I think, is the graduating class. So the party was great. The kids stayed all night long from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. Um, they had a great time, and it was a Herculean effort by probably 100 parents who decorated, planned it, fed them, chaperoned them, played games with them, but they had a great time. So thank you to the community for the support and the schools for the support and everything. It was a great, great end send-off to the kids. So that was it for me. And I did leave at your place. I know several of you are parents of graduates, so you were at the awards night and got the uh, the listing of, of awards and scholarships and certificates of achievement and so on. And so that list is there for your uh, enjoyment. Um, I think it was about three hundred forty thousand dollars presented that night, all from local scholarships, not not from the colleges, but from local scholarships. So. And many of those are Hingham families in memory of someone, or they are uh, businesses that are, that are local. Um, so a lot of work and uh, by the guidance department in getting all of that organized, and I think all the checks in the right envelopes and that sort of thing. So. That is a big effort as well, and extremely generous of this fantastic town for all those funds for the, for the students. It definitely helps. Um, all right, so item number five, communications. So you have some communications, Dot? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, we talked at the last meeting about um, our our being the the leadership team um, signing on to a, a resolution similar to, if not identical to, the one that the school committee approved a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so I did speak last uh, week with uh, that leadership team and, and asked them if they uh, would be wanting to, to sign with those of us at central office that certainly we're going to sign on. And, and uh, I've heard from just about everyone at this, uh, at, at this point and all happy to do that. So uh, we will make appropriate changes uh, very minor changes, not certainly in the intent of the resolution, but in the actual wording, and uh, and get that to you. So I'm not sure where we are with respect to student uh, a piece of it, but um, but you can you can count on us to be part of the message. Thank you very much. Um, the Nicole Piantes did get back to me that the student council did unanimously vote the to pass the joint resolution with the school committee. Yes, yeah, so that was great news. Sorry if I stole your thunder, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, that's great. So I, do you have any other communications? Or that's it? All right, so 5.2, student communications. Um, this past Thursday, we had our Hingham High School senior prom, and with many helping hands, it was a success. Um, as the excitement for the seniors continued, graduation was on Saturday night. With speeches from Mr. Swanson, Mrs. Eyre, the, sal the sal salutatorian, Dylan Davis, the valed valedictorian, Kelly Austenberg, a volunteered speaker, Joe Cavanaugh, and to finish, the class president, Maeve Lee. Uh, for those there, they probably know it started off to be a gross night and it turned into a moment many will remember. <laughs> Shared by Maeve Lee, the senior class raised over $40,000 
and everyone graduating has a plan for the future, whether it's spending time fighting for the country, working, or going to school. Later that night, thanks to many parents, including Mrs. Ayer, uh, the seniors were able to attend a well-run and fun senior night. And you know it's fun when my brother comes home showing me videos of him being hypnotized and singing All the Single Ladies by Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> um, Highlight of the night. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as the year comes to an end, many sports teams finish up their season games and get together to try to win some t t tournament state championships. Um, also at our last Duco meeting, as Mrs. Ayer just mentioned, uh, we did read and voted on the safety policies and it was passed. Um, also at that meeting, we found out that Ms. Piantes um, has retired as the head advisor for the student council and Mrs. Black, a history teacher, has decided to take over. Um, in addition, the summer reading book drive is being held this week and the books donated will be sold next week. Um, this is anyone can drop off any books that are summer reading requirement or optional books and next week they'll be sold for three dollars at 730 in the main lobby of the high school. Um, and lastly, today we started the Pack the Pantry food drive we'll, we'll, which will last until the 15th. Great. Thank you so much, Emma. All right, uh, 5.3, any other communications? All right, no? Yeah, all right. Um, item 6, new business, 6.1, to receive the Foreign Language Department Program Review from Erica Pollard. Hi everyone. Uh, I want to thank the school committee and Dr. Gallo, Dr. Labilla, and Mr. Ferris for having me here tonight. How do I close this? Top right, see the blue box come up? And that makes it go. There we go. Um, where did the video go? There we go. Maybe. Is it open somewhere else? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I that's okay. Why don't you let me work it It was open. <laughs> Nobody voted on anything in my presence. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's the PowerPoint. Okay. Here we go. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. So, assuming that it's going to cooperate, I wanted to start tonight with a short video that was produced by our friends at Harbor Media that is going to highlight some of the great things that the Foreign Language Department has been working on. Mm -hmm. There we go. Perfect. Spanish, but we're also learning 
learning about language in general and about how learning a language works. So there's a lot of focus at that level on strategies, on skills, particularly on the skill of identifying and using cognates. So understanding that there are lots of words in Spanish that are really closely related to words they already know in English. When you learn a foreign language from a younger age, you benefit cognitively, you benefit academically, as well as socially. Um, so cognitively, they say the, the more exposure you have uh, over your entire lifetime, starting from a younger age, the less apt you are to get dementia or develop um, Alzheimer's or some kind of memory disorder just due to how the brain works and how it works over many years. Academically, learning a foreign language from a younger age specifically, it helps support your performance in other subjects. So that can be social studies, math, science, English, even art and music. The younger you start learning a foreign language, the better you are at taking standardized tests, at multitasking, and at critical thinking. So it does support the, the learning of a foreign language. And socially, the less inhibitions you have about making a silly sound or stringing sounds together that are might sound funny for you or learning the phonetics and the pronunciation in a different language. So uh, kind of the younger you are when you start to get used to those things, the better you are over time. And I think they say it's around puberty when if you haven't started to acquire language, it's going to actually become harder for you. I just think that the longer they're exposed to it, the longer they have to become better at it. They're, they're already learning to read, they're already learning to write, they're already learning math. So what we do is we just do that in Spanish. It bridges the gap and it connects the Spanish room, the Spanish classroom to what they're doing with their teachers and, and reading and writing already. You know, it's fun to see them walk out, you know, proud of themselves and their abilities. At the middle school, uh, foreign language learning starts to get a little bit more academic. In sixth grade, students meet every other day, but starting in seventh grade and eighth grade, they meet every day, and it's a regular academic class. They are learning more intermediate level skills, which is how do I take those words and turn them into sentences that help me to communicate about what I want to say. We're still focused on basic communication, on skills and tasks that kids are going to encounter in their everyday life. I really like the middle school um, because I feel that the kids are um, enthusiastic and still very interested in learning and even though they might not be as mature as the high school kids just yet I feel like they're nice enough and like cute enough that they want to learn it it's very interesting because it's pretty much the first time they're getting into a lot of the grammar and more vocab than they do from elementary school and they're really starting to learn more about um, stru grammar structures and some of them have no idea and some of you know some of them end up learning a lot more about their own language through that now it's a lot more hands-on um, where they have Chromebooks and we have a great foreign language lab so we can go in they can get partnered up they can talk to each other I really like when they can you know kind of connect something to a place that they've traveled to they're able to say oh you know Senora Fossi I was able to you know order my meal in Mexico in Spanish and it was great and they really feel confident about that they don't have to just sit by themselves in front of a book and memorize it all. They can actually relate it to interviewing their partners and they definitely um, are getting homework. They're, um, they're able to use their online text and so they're getting more familiar with using technology in a different language and I think that's also good for other courses. And also, of course, there's a whole ge geography where they're getting prepared where they have a world geography class in seventh grade we're already learning about Spanish-speaking countries or French-speaking countries in the beginning of the year, so by the time they get to, to that uh, towards the end of the year, they already know a lot of the countries and the capitals, and they're familiar with that area, so I know that they feel confident with that. In the high school, we're looking at more advanced language proficiency, and that means how do I take those sentences and link them together to be paragraphs or essays uh, to convince somebody of a point that I want to make or to do research of my own about a topic related to the culture that we're studying. We all believe that learning Chinese makes them more competitive in life for uh, admission to, to colleges. You can take me as an example. You, if you can speak a, a new language, you get more job opportunity. Like I moved to this country 10 years ago and I got a teaching job in two years if I cannot speak English, no way I can do that. The U.S. government actually view a few languages as critical languages, which means learning this language
languages can be critical for U.S. national security. So in Chinese, it's one of those uh, critical languages. I want to say my favorite thing about teaching is about teaching Chinese characters. That's, that's different. You know, most of languages only have one system. The spelling and speaking, they are connected. But Chinese actually have two systems, one speaking system and one writing system. You can speak, doesn't mean you can read and write. It's hard, but by learning characters, it can help students not only develop literacy, but also help them develop like, characters like being patient, and you uh, can pay attention to details. You know, learning language is also to learn a culture and help people to communicate better and understand each other's culture better and be more culturally sensitive and tolerant. We do have a lot of opportunities for students to use their language outside of the classroom, and that's really important. It's an important part of what we do to organize either daily field trips or visitors or trips abroad. We have sponsored trips all over the world. Um, we have sent groups to China, to Japan, to Montreal to France. We've done all kinds of different trips too. Um, for example, I was part of the Dominican Republic trip, which was a service trip. So that was extremely rewarding for students. It was very eye-opening. The fact that they're able to choose from so many different trips and so many different experiences when they're still in high school is really amazing. This way, when they leave Hingham High School, they can get to college already having such amazing cultural experiences. We do have some things that we're working on sort of rolling out that are new this year and hopefully next year. One of the big ones that we're working on is Massachusetts recently signed into law a uh, seal of biliteracy. And the seal of biliteracy is recognized by the state when a student has achieved a certain level of proficiency in a second language. So when they can demonstrate proficiency in two languages, they get this distinction which shows up on their transcript and sort of can prove to a college or to an employer that they have this measurable skill in a foreign language. This is the first year that we have offered it. We're starting testing this spring. But we actually have a whole lot of students who have qualified already to win these awards based on their AP scores. The curriculum for the AP Spanish Literature course is a lot like the syllabus that I had when I was in graduate school. So for me to be able to share the works that I read in graduate school with my high school seniors I think is incredible. My favorite part of my job now as director is that I get to be in all of these classrooms K through 12 and see the amazing things that teachers are working on. They are people who are really excited about teaching but also really excited about what they teach so that their classroom is a really fun place to be. It's amazing to see kids really get to the point where they can go wow all that stuff that you taught me I can use it. I can really do this. I can really ask for directions. I can really order my own food. I can really converse with somebody in this foreign language. For we do live in a community where people care about the bigger world. People understand that the world is bigger than Hingham, and it's bigger than Massachusetts, and it's bigger than the United States. And that means that our students have to be able to communicate with people who don't speak English. All right, I want to thank Harbor Media for helping to produce that video to show. There are lots of things that I could tell you about our programs, but sometimes it's more interesting to hear it from some of the teachers and see some of it in action. So I want to share with you tonight some of the highlights of our, uh, our program in the foreign language department. I won't go into as much detail on every point as I did in my written report, but if you have questions about anything in the written report, I'll be happy to answer them for you at the end. Uh, I think it's important to connect the work of the Foreign Language Department to the overarching mission of the Hingham Public Schools, um, particularly that last part. We want to enable all students to develop the knowledge and skills necessary for success as local and global citizens. And in order to become productive global citizens, students have to have proficiency in a second language and an understanding of other cultures. I see that as a really important part of global citizenship. 
Um, increasing global interdependence means that the ability to communicate in a language other than English is very important. And proficiency in a foreign language provides an in-depth understanding of a different culture's values and its beliefs, and it promotes respect for differences from our own culture. So for those reasons, I think that the work that the language department is doing is incredibly important. Now, to accomplish this goal of helping our students to become global citizens, the foreign language department focuses on what are known as the five C's of foreign language teaching. These are endorsed by the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, which is ACTFL for short, and they also form the basis of the Massachusetts foreign language curriculum frameworks. Uh, they sort of provide the context in which foreign language programming has been developed for our schools. And the five C's are, to begin with, communication. We hope that students will be able to communicate effectively. Cultures, that they will interact with cultural competence and understanding. Connections, they'll connect what they learn in their foreign language classes with what they're learning in other disciplines and be acquiring information and different perspectives through their second language studies. They're going to make comparisons. They're going to not only learn how to communicate in a language, but also learn about language, uh, how their own language works and how it compares to the language they're learning. And communities. We hope that our students will learn to communicate and interact with cultural competence to participate in multilingual communities, whether those are close to home or far away. Now, I think it's helpful in order to better understand the structure of our program to talk very quickly about the way that proficiency in a foreign language is measured, because it's a little bit different from what you might see in some other disciplines. Um, these proficiency levels, like the five C's that I just showed you, are set by the American Council for the Teaching of Foreign Languages, and they form an important part as well of the Massachusetts Frameworks for Foreign Language. Part of what the Massachusetts Frameworks does is talk not only about content, but about skills, about proficiency. And proficiency is what students can do with language in real world situations that are not practiced, that are completely spontaneous. So proficiency isn't tied to a list of vocabulary or a list of verb conjugations. It's about whether or not you can complete a task. So at the novice level, the tasks that students are completing are very simple. They're usually at the word level. So we're talking about very practiced lists of words and basic phrases. At the intermediate level, they're building up to be able to use sentences but also to be able to create a little bit with language, to produce language that they maybe haven't practiced or heard before, but can produce based on the patterns that they've heard. At the advanced level, <coughs> students can communicate in the past, the present, and the future, and they can handle situations where something goes wrong. So if there's a problem, they can use their language skills to solve it. And then at the top of the scale there, so those superior and distinguished uh, distinctions are where students can really use language in an abstract way. They can make a hypothesis or talk about something that's abstract. They can support their opinion with a list of facts um, and handle a much more serious complication if need be. So one of the things that the Massachusetts Frameworks for Foreign Language tells us is how much time approximately students will spend at each level of proficiency on this scale. So that's one of the things that I'll refer back to as I talk about the structure of the program. So at the elementary level, our students have Spanish from kindergarten through fifth grade. We are lucky that we have a Spanish teacher in each of our four elementary schools, and students have Spanish class once every six day cycle. Um, the focus is gonna be at that novice level that I just talked about, but with a communicative focus. So we're gonna focus on the tasks and topics that are going to be useful to children. Teachers use a wide variety of methodologies to meet a whole different variety of needs. You know, elementary classrooms can be very diverse and our teachers are very skilled in meeting the needs of a lot of different students. And they're not only teaching students Spanish, but they're also teaching students how to learn a language. So they're doing a lot of work, for example, with the alphabet. 
uh, that supports the work in phonics and decoding that kids are doing in their ELA studies. Uh, and they're learning about language learning strategies. What do I do when I come across a word that I don't understand? Um, cognates is a huge skill that they focus on at the elementary level, but also determining the meaning of a new term through context, um, using pictures, for example, in a text to help support what you're reading when there's unfamiliar words. These are all skills that are really transferable to their other studies and is going to help our students to become stronger readers, not only in Spanish, but also in English. Um, we have a focus at this level on predictable routines because they provide students with a lot of practice. It takes a lot of time and practice to learn a second language. So kids, for example, will have this calendar um, routine that they go through every day. Even by first grade, the kids can do this no problem. They can tell you the day of the week, uh, what day it is today, what day it will be tomorrow, what's the date, what's the season. They can do all of that in Spanish because they've practiced it a lot. Um, we also see at this stage the same types of vocabulary topics that are recycled with increasing depth. So for example, family is a topic that is obviously very important. It's one that at the element, at the kindergarten level, we might learn a short number of words. We might learn just to talk about our immediate family. And then in first grade, when we come back to that topic, we're going to come back to it with a little bit more depth. The task gets a little bit more complex. The vocabulary gets a little bit more varied. So the kids are coming back to those topics and having opportunities to review and practice every year. So to connect back to that proficiency scale that I showed you a minute ago, this is where we expect our students will be at the end of fifth grade. Um, the proficiency targets are broken down by skill level, uh, sorry, by, by um, skill area, so listening, reading, speaking, and writing. And this gives us a general overview of what we hope that students can do at the end of fifth grade. At the middle school, our students have the option to choose between Spanish and French. In the sixth grade, they meet every other day, and then starting in seventh grade, they meet every day. Starting then in eighth grade, they have the option to choose either an advanced or an upper standard level course in Spanish or French. At this level, just like at the elementary level, we're still focusing on communicative skills. What is the task that you can complete using this language that you have learned? It's much more than memorizing a list of verbs or some conjugations or tenses. It's about what you can do with it. There's also a strong focus at the middle school level on strategies for language learning. Because a lot of these strategies are transferable and the same strategies that will make kids successful in a foreign language class are going to help them be successful in other classes as well. Our teachers at this level are able to meet the needs of a wide variety of learners and they plan really engaging instruction that gets kids very excited about learning a language. So by the end of eighth grade, this is about where we hope our students will be, is at the novice high level. Now you might look at this and say, this seems like a really long time to be at what we term the novice level. But this is in line with what the Massachusetts frameworks um, anticipate for students with this level of exposure, with this many hours of practice under their belt. This is about where we can expect them to be. And again, this is spontaneous, unpracticed language, which means that often kids in class are completing tasks at a higher level because they're familiar tasks. They've practiced them. They've learned the appropriate vocabulary. And so they're able to perform tasks at a higher level as long as there's support. All right, at the high school level, we have lots of choices. Uh, students can choose to continue with Spanish or French, or they can choose Chinese or Latin. Um, I think it's interesting to note that if you look at enrollment data in foreign language courses from 2010 to today, um, about every, every year about 85% of high school students are enrolled in a foreign language course. And that's significant because the graduation requirement is two years. So we can assume that about half of the kids at the high school need to be in a foreign language class. But a lot more of them are choosing it, which I think is significant for a lot of reasons. Um, 
the number of students also who are enrolling in fourth year language classes, our Spanish five, French five, Chinese four, Latin four classes, that number is also rising significantly, which tells me that more and more kids are sticking with their language study through all four years of high school, which I think is great. As I said, it takes a long time to get proficient, so I love to see them stick around in those programs for as long as possible. Our programs, both at the high school and at the middle school, are supplemented by a wide variety of co-curricular activities. And they're a really important part of what we do, because if you think back to those five C's, the last one is communities. And the kids need to be connected either to a local community, one that we've created that's a, a linguistic community, or when it's possible, to communities a little bit outside of our own comfort zone. So our teachers plan a wide variety of field trips and travel experiences for kids. Some of them take kids really far away and some of them are fairly close to home. But it's all trying to get to that community's aspect of language learning, to help them to connect to languages, to places where their languages are spoken, and to really get a chance to try them out. So the proficiency targets for high school vary fairly widely because we have a wide variety of courses available. But this is a standard set of proficiency targets for an AP language course. And to give a little bit of perspective, if you're familiar with uh, advanced placement exams, an intermediate mid result is about generally associated with a three on an AP exam, which is the lowest passing score uh, for an advanced placement test. Uh, many of our students are actually exceeding these proficiency targets by the end of high school, and I will show you some data on that in just a minute. All right. So I want to tell you about a few major changes since the last time there was a program review. I'm going to focus on the three that are in bold because I think that those are the most significant ones. Um, when I started with the Hingham Public Schools, I taught two sections of Chinese. And in the time that I've been here, the program has grown to the point where we now have two teachers, which is wonderful, and we are able to offer Chinese one all the way through AP. We've had some good success with the AP course, and I'm really proud of the way that this program has grown. Um, I hope that it's gonna continue to grow, not only because obviously it's very close to my heart personally, but I think that knowledge of Chinese is really important for our students because of the role that China plays in the world today. So I'm pleased that this program has flourished the way that it has. Um, another significant change is the adoption of a new textbook series for Spanish over the last few years. We reviewed a wide variety of textbook offerings before making our choice, uh, and the textbook that we chose is called Español by Santiana. Very creative name, I know. And what we were looking for when we selected a test text was something that would have that communicative focus that I've talked about, not just a list, but a focus on communicative tasks, and that would be accessible to all of our students, something that we really felt like every student could be successful with. We selected this text because we felt like it checked those boxes as well as quite a few more. It has a great online pr platform for practice. Um, that allows kids, this is an example of an online activity that the kids can do with our online text. They can match the photos, you know, do a little bit of reading practice and match it with an image. Then they get immediate feedback as to how they did. This allows students to really check their understanding and understand what they're not understanding right then in the moment. Uh, the text also does a really nice job of integrating culture. It's not just an add-on, it's a real central part of the text. And provides a whole wide variety of ancillary materials, including some graded readers that go along with it, that we've found to be really helpful. Now, because we have these digital resources, uh, kids at the middle school are able to use them on their Chromebooks, uh, or in the language lab that was mentioned in the video, or right here on their smart boards in the classroom. Uh, and the last big thing is the seal of biliteracy that I mentioned in the video that you just saw, so I won't go into too much detail except to show you some results. One thing that's nice about the seal of biliteracy is that it recognizes student achievement in language learning no matter where the student learned the language. 
So if they learned it with us at, in the Hingham Public Schools, that's great. But if it's a language that they learned somewhere else, I think it's also important to recognize that. And so the Seal of Biliteracy gives us a tool to recognize achievement in almost any language uh, and regardless of where the learning came from. This year, we asked students to apply for this award and they paid a small fee to participate in the testing. But going forward, I'd really love to work on ways to identify eligible students who might not apply um, and to expand this testing a little bit because it really was very successful <coughs> this year. Um, if I connect to those proficiency targets that I showed you a minute ago, you can see that the silver seal is that intermediate mid. That's where we set our proficiency target for our AP courses. Gold is intermediate high. And platinum is advanced low, which is really a very impressive amount of language proficiency for a student in high school. It, it's really achievement at a very high level. Uh, so we were able to give 93 total awards to students this year. 32 of them qualified based on their AP exams that they took during their junior year. And the remainder qualified by taking a proficiency exam either so for French, Chinese, and Spanish, it's called the STAMP exam, which stands for Standard Based, Standards Based Measurement of Proficiency, or the ALIRA test, which is only for Latin um, because it tests uh, interpretive reading skills. So by taking one of those three tests, students were able to qualify for this award. And one of the things that I think is great about this program is it gives them quantifiable proof of what they can do with a language that they could use when applying to college, when applying for a job, uh, maybe going to a study abroad program, it's something that they're gonna be able to carry with them. I'm gonna highlight for you a few of our program strengths. Again, I'll focus on the ones in bold. The first and most important one are our highly qualified staff. I am not exaggerating when I say that I really can't say enough about the teachers in this department. They are highly proficient in the languages that they teach, but also they're very skilled in the techniques that help students to acquire those languages. Just speaking a language isn't enough to make you a teacher. I speak English, but I think I'd be a terrible English teacher. You have to really know about how to get the skills of that particular language and make them accessible to students. And that's something our teachers are very good at. They also are extremely knowledgeable about culture, about music, literature, history, geography, of all the places where those languages are spoken. This means that they're able to make connections to their students that's, that are really meaningful. Our teachers work hard. They're available for extra help. They go to conferences and take courses, and they are constantly trying to be better at what they do. They also go out of their way to provide those co-curricular opportunities that I talked about before that are so important for helping students to understand linguistic communities. We've got pictures here from the Latin Club. That's the, the pumpkin that is uh, carved like a mythological monster. <laughs> a trip to a Mexican restaurant. And at the top there, a photo from our Chinese exchange program this year. We had a group of students come from China to stay in Hingham for a few weeks and interact with our students. Um, We've had teachers take students to Spain and to France and to Canada and to China, and all of those are things that they do because they want to. You know, they're not required, but they really go above and beyond to make those valuable opportunities available to our students. I think another important support of, important strength of our program, sorry, is the fact that it does so strongly support our mission statement and has some important cross-curricular applications. So I won't go into it in as much detail as I did in my written report, but learning a second language leads to a lot of cognitive benefits for students, particularly when it's learned at a young age. Students who learn a second language have better test scores, they have better memory function, they have improved reading skills in their first language as well as in their second language. Um, bigger vocabulary, better um, spatial abilities, and improved abilities to problem solve. Just to mention, you know, quickly a few things. In addition, students are able to deepen their understanding of art, music, history, geography, a whole host of other things that they're learning about in other classes 
through their studies in the target language. So the pictures that I've added here are from a project uh, that's done in Spanish 4, where the teachers collaborated with uh, the art department <laughs> to learn about various <laughs> forms of art. They teach the students about these various forms of art in Spanish. The students create their own art, and then they have to articulate what the message of their artwork is in Spanish. So they're not just learning, you know, I like this painting. They're learning how to talk about what art really means and view it critically as part of their foreign language studies. And again, by helping our students to develop proficiency in a second language, we're putting them on that pathway for success as local and global citizens. Another important strength of our program is uh, the presence of our two language labs. We have one at the high school and one at the middle school, and these are really great tools for teaching a second language. It's important that students hear voices other than their teachers when they're learning a second language, and the lab really opens us up so that we are able to communicate digitally with people all over the world. Students get a chance to hear other people speak the language that they're studying. And it also allows the teachers to really effectively differentiate, give individualized feedback to students, and provide a lot of opportunities for speaking and listening practice. And another important strength of our program is the strength of our standardized test scores. Again, I went into a little bit more detail on this in my written report, but you can see that the standardized test scores, particularly the AP exam scores for foreign language are very strong. Um, you'll notice that we didn't start giving the Chinese exam until a little bit later. The first time we gave it was in 2013 and there weren't enough students then to give us any useful data on how the kids did. Um, but the scores across the board are very, very strong. Um, logically, you'd expect that the scores in Chinese and Latin are going to be a little bit lower than in French and Spanish because they have fewer years to study those languages, but the bar in terms of proficiency is still set in the same place. So they have less time to get to the same level of proficiency. But even so, uh, in all of the language exams that we have given, we are above the national averages. So. I think that that's very impressive. Uh, this particular chart doesn't show Chinese because we weren't able to offer that course last year, but we can see that in French and in Latin and in the two AP Spanish courses, the standardized test scores are very good. All right, concerns. This list is shorter. Um, my first concern is time for collaboration. At the high school, all of the teachers have uh, common planning time by language. And this really allows them to work together uh, to develop common lessons, common assessments, to talk about student success in a meaningful way. But unfortunately, that's a lot harder to do at the middle school and at the elementary school. At the elementary school, I'm not sure that there's any way around it because the teachers are physically in four different buildings. Um, but at the middle school, I think that it would be very beneficial for teachers to have common planning time by department. I think that it would help them to uh, plan more consistent lessons and to develop common assessments, which are important for us to use to analyze uh, how students are doing. My next program concern is about technology. I said before that we have two language labs and they're wonderful. Uh, we benefit greatly at the high school from the presence of a lab coordinator. Um, she is able to help us to troubleshoot technical issues, to serve as our liaison with the software company, and to really help teachers to use all the functions of the lab to their highest capacity. Um, I think that having a lab coordinator at the middle school would help us to similarly use the middle school lab to its full potential. And it would also help us to prevent damage to the lab. Um, the way that the lab is set up, the teacher is stuck in one place at the front of the room, which means that sometimes you get kids, you know, pulling on cords or poking at keyboards, and it's very difficult to <coughs> monitor that kind of behavior. We've done a few things that I think have helped with that over the last couple of years, but I still think that having a full-time lab coordinator at the middle school would help us to use that space to a better benefit. 
And lastly, um, I told you that our elementary Spanish program allows for students to have, generally speaking, one period of Spanish per six-day cycle. And that's incredibly valuable because it's <laughs> still providing a great basis for future learning. It's developing those transferable skills that kids are going to be able to apply to other disciplines and developing those cultural understandings that are so important. Our elementary teachers do an amazing job with the time that they have. But I think that if they had more time, they could do even more incredible things. This, you know, an hour per six day cycle, it's actually more like 40 minutes, is not enough to really build a lot of proficiency. And if we had more time, I think we'd see greater results. So that takes me to future directions. And the very first future direction has to do with elementary school. Um, FLES stands for the, um, stands for foreign language in elementary schools. And I think, as I mentioned, building proficiency takes a lot of time. And I recognize that there aren't more minutes in the day, especially not at elementary school. Um, there are a lot of mandates on every minute of kids' time. But we also know that building proficiency takes a lot of time and that our youngest students are the ones who will cognitively benefit the most from early language learning. So what I would suggest as a way to get around the lack of extra minutes in the day would be to look at a program that's called content-based FLES. Again, FLES is foreign language in elementary schools. What this would mean would be to look really carefully at our existing curriculum in the elementary schools for areas where it would be possible to for Spanish teachers to collaborate with classroom teachers. So we have currently sort of a pull out model where kids go to a specialist, they go to Spanish class and they leave their classroom teacher. Um, I think that it might be beneficial to also add sort of a push in model where the Spanish teachers visit the regular classroom and collaborate with the teacher. So for example, uh, our kindergarten Spanish students learn about colors. And I'm sure that they also learn about colors in art, right? So is there a way that we could integrate the learning of Spanish and art and do practice together? Therefore, increasing the amount of time that kids have to learn Spanish without taking time away from other things. It would require that we look really carefully for appropriate places to integrate this kind of teaching. Uh, my other future directions include uh, improving and increasing our use of data to really analyze <coughs> what our students are learning and improve our instruction as we can. Uh, we are working on the process of developing common assessments for our courses, which will tell us uh, where our students are struggling, what they're doing really well at, and help us to adjust instruction so that all of our students do better. We will, of course, continue to analyze the results of the AP exam data and data from the STAMP and ALIRA tests that I mentioned earlier that are used to qualify for the seal of biliteracy. And finally, uh, another future direction is to do more community outreach. I mentioned in the video that I think I'm very lucky to work in a community where people value learning a second language. Uh, but I think that there's always more that we can do to interact with our community right here in Hingham. So I'm looking at ways that we can increase elementary enrichment, um, particularly at the elementary level um, through World Language Week, which is celebrated every year at the elementary schools. This year, our food services director, Kim Smith, did a great job of organizing an international menu for the schools that week to go along with the international lessons that kids were receiving in class. Um, but I would like to look for ways to build on this and expand on the opportunity for students to learn about other cultures at the elementary level. At the middle school, we're looking at developing an international night. Uh, we'd like to invite families to celebrate the cultures that students are learning about and also share their own cultural backgrounds. I think that there are people here in Hingham who bring with them their own unique cultural heritage and we'd like to invite them to share. And at the high school, um, we're hoping next year to develop foreign language national honor societies. So those would be connected to the, there's a national group for each language uh, that we offer at the high school. 
And I think that by offering an honor society at the high school level, it gives us another opportunity to celebrate what our kids are doing and also to get them involved in communities because honor societies always involve community engagement. Uh, I would also like to continue to offer those opportunities that I spoke about earlier for students to engage with target language communities, either through trips abroad, through field trips, or through exchange programs. Earlier this year, we had a very successful exchange program with a group of students from China, and I would love to discuss with the committee the possibility of carrying out a two-way exchange where we would send our students to another country to live with families for a short period of time, uh, because I think it can be a really valuable experience in understanding another language and culture. So it's something I'd like to discuss a little further. So in conclusion, I'm very proud of the work that the foreign language department is doing. It's an incredible group of teachers who are doing an incredible job to teach some pretty fantastic kids. And I look forward to continuing our work together in the years to come. Thank you. Very impressive. Thank you, Erica. Are there any questions I can answer for you? I have a few questions. Okay. Um, so you, one of your concerns was having a foreign language coordinator, is that the title? A lab coordinator. A so, lab coordinator. So like a, a technology person. Right. Um, we didn't have that in the original budget this year. Yeah, we yeah. My question, though, was the use at the high school and the use at the middle school, are they fairly similar um, or uh, would you say at the high school the language lab gets used more frequently and, and just to, to get, have a kind of a picture yeah. of the I would say that the amount of time is probably similar as in both of the labs are used most of the time but I definitely see a difference in the way that they're used um, I think that the high school teachers um, and this is not any no intended criticism of the middle school teachers. They simply don't have access to the same resources of having somebody to help them troubleshoot, um, to help them figure out new things to do. And so they're a little bit more limited in what they can do with the lab because they don't have the same kind of support that we have at the high school. Okay. Um, and then other, how many, I'm just kind of curious because it starts with Spanish and then the kids get to choose between Spanish and French. And then when they get to high school, they get to choose from the four languages. How many kids actually leave Spanish? Um, would you say, so in middle school, half go to French and half go to Spanish, and then how many, I'm just curious, at the end of the, you know, by the senior year, or the kids that continue with the language, how many are still doing Spanish? So Spanish continues to be the largest program, and it makes sense that it would be, because we have the elementary program, and a lot of students see the value in continuing with that once they get into middle school. The middle school, the split is about two-thirds Spanish to about a third of French. And then when it comes to high school, I don't know that there's any discernible trend as to whether there's more former Spanish students or more former French students going to Chinese and Latin. I think it's a fairly even split. Okay, just kind of curious what kids are into nowadays. Um, Chinese is amazing. I don't think we had that when we were going to school. And then the stamp Alina test, is that recognized worldwide? Or worldwide, I couldn't tell you. Um, one of the benefits of those particular tests is that they're aligned with that proficiency scale the American Council for the Teaching of Foreign Languages uses. And so that makes them fairly, even if someone isn't familiar with that specific test, it makes the results easily understandable to anybody who's familiar with that proficiency scale. Um, I can tell you that Alira and Stamp are both very widely used in the United States. Um, they are the primary tests that are used for seal of biliteracy testing across the country. Um, I think there's 22 states now that have seal of biliteracy legislation in place and the majority of those schools use either Alira or Stamp. Okay. The reason why I ask is because I actually, I'm fan of German. German was my major. I lived in Germany for 12 years. And when I, I took a test, it was with the Goethe Institute. And you might be familiar with that institution. Mm -hmm. I'm sure French, Latin, they all have one. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't know the details. 
And uh, so I did take an exam, and it's recognized world. That's why I was asking. I was wondering if any of our kids do that kind of exam. It's great. So if I applied for a job, let's say, in London or in New York, and I said I took this exam, it would be recognized literally worldwide, and people anywhere in the world would recognize what kind of um, standard that test is. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious um, if you've looked into any of that. Uh, so part of what... Um, led to selecting those particular tests has to do with the fact that they are, and I can't speak specifically to the German test, I can speak more to the, the Chinese test. There's a very similar test uh, in China. If I were to go and I wanted to get a job in China, I would take the HSK test. Okay. And um, the HSK test, again, I can't speak to the German one, is not really a proficiency test. It's based on a very specific set of parameters and even a very specific vocabulary list. So the test that you use for a seal of biliteracy needs to be a proficiency test, which means that it needs to be fairly open-ended. And one of the things that's nice about these two tests is that they're computer adaptive tests. So students took them, they take them in our language lab. Uh, if you answer a question correctly, it gives you a harder level question. If you answer it incorrectly, it gives you a lower level question. So it's able to uh, a, a lot of the international proficiency tests are you take, for example, HSK level one, HSK level two. Mm -hmm. This is one test that covers all the bases. Okay. All right, well, thank you. No problem. I have a couple questions. Um, on the seal of biliteracy, mm -hmm. I was just curious, how many, do you know how many kids passed that test who were not taught the language by Hingham High School or not taught at, a, at an AP level or? So as for not taught at Hingham High School, not many, uh -huh. but I'm hoping that we can get more students. I know that those students are there, yeah. but I think a lot of them didn't know that this opportunity existed this year. So yeah. one of my goals for next year will be to get some of those kids on board and do testing in other languages. Yeah. Um, another advantage of the stamp test is that it's available in dozens of languages. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of options. Um, the test takers this year were pretty evenly split between juniors and seniors. Um, some of them were kids in AP classes in their senior year, and some of them were kids in, you know, upper standard or honors junior level classes. Oh, that's great. Yeah, because yeah. it, you know, it's an opportunity for make it available to all students um, and showcase a skill that, that might not come out by the rigor of the class that they're in, but give them that one up on their I think a lot of the future. students who took the test were pleasantly surprised by how well they did. And I think it was a real confidence boost for those students to see that what they had learned was really getting them someplace. Yeah, that's, that, uh, I'm really excited that you introduced it because I think it's, you know, going in the future and, um, then another comment I had on your community outreach. Um, on the foreign language national honor societies, um, it crossed my mind that the students who would be eligible for that would also be involved with the National Honor Society and faced with a very large load. Mm -hmm. And if adding on an additional community service requirement and I'm sensitive to social emotional learning and Absolutely. especially in the later years and when they're at that high level of pressure and classes so if we can keep that in mind for the students and not over achieve them <laughs> no I think that's uh, an excellent I, point I, it's it's wonderful um, but I am cognizant of the demands on them Absolutely. and their time. Um, um, the so. qualifications for being eligible for a foreign language honor society are not exactly the same as, there will definitely be overlap, don't get me yeah. wrong, but they're not exactly the same as the qualifications for um, the National Honor Society. I think w we would also like to, so community service is part of it, but part of what we'd also like to measure away from, because kids are doing service, like you say, through yeah. n the um, National Honor Society, we'd like to look at instead <laughs> measuring community engagement. So participating, for example, in activities that are language related, right. 
at the school or in the local community, um, I'm hoping would be a slightly less stress-inducing way to keep yeah. kids involved. So that my follow-up on that is how would it integrate with the requirements of the Global Citizenship Program? Because that has become very popular, very successful, and it engages all language students and not just the top level students and gives them an opportunity to participate in something they enjoy mm -hmm. even if they you know don't have the academic ability to achieve at such a high level and on that too having your middle school international night might be an opportunity to introduce those families to the global citizenship program oh, that's a great idea so that there's a look forward of the next step um, of you know what they could do when they get to high school. Yeah. Um, if you have a captive audience. Um, Absolutely, that's great so, to consider. Um, and I would like to thank you and all your teachers for the tremendous work you do. I, my children have, you know, excelled with their languages and enjoyed it. Um, they weren't top AP students, but I even have one who's a language major in college and mm -hmm thriving with that and so it's the inspiration from the experience at Hingham High School that kept them going at it um, and that speaks to the the staff and how engaging they are so I, I thank you for um, everything you bring to thank the you. community That's wonderful it's really to hear. wonderful and Carlos Arabic, as a foreigner and I speak <laughs> of other languages like I appreciate very much what you department does uh, can you just elaborate on your uh, goal to introduce the exchange program? I mean, you, you don't have <coughs> any program right now where the kids go and stay with other families? We don't. Um, in the past, uh, when we have proposed <coughs> exchange programs like this, um, we've occasionally run into issues with concerns about safety. Uh, but I don't, I think that, you know, the, the landscape of international exchange has changed even over the last 10 years where we would have the capability to do pretty in-depth background checks on families that our students were going to stay with, which maybe wasn't the case in the past, but would be the case now. Um, I know that when I participated in international exchange programs in high school, I am <coughs> sure that there were no background checks, but that's something that's very reasonable to expect now. Um, so I just, as someone who benefited greatly from that kind of a program myself, I think it's wonderful to put kids really in the middle of using a second language to communicate. And what is the time line, I mean, how long you envision that this would be happening? 30 days? Uh, I think probably in the range of two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, I mean, I see uh, that a lot of students are actually taking a gap year to go overseas, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's Latin America or Africa, um, just to sort of like, you know, expose themselves uh, to, you know, other languages out there, and they can actually learn hands-on by doing it. So um, you have my support and then let's see if we, if we can do something. When we brought the students from China here this winter, um, when they left, they immediately started to ask, well, could we have your students come and stay with us? Like they would, that particular school would love to have a two-way exchange program. Uh, and it's definitely something I'd like to pursue. Thank you. Um, what support does your department need to get more common planning time for th at the elementary level and especially at the middle school? So at the elementary level, we have made use of um, workshop time. So we'll get subs sometimes for the day or for part of a day to get all the teachers together in the same place. And so I'm not sure that I could envision, again, because of the geographic <coughs> distance between them, uh, a better solution for that. Mm -hmm. um, at, the high, at the middle school level, uh, it's about how the schedule is built. Um, and so while I have made recommendations, I guess, about what I hope that people will teach, mm -hmm. I, I don't, uh, I guess I'm not sure that I know the answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. All right. Uh, Oh, Dot needs her computer back. I'll give her a second. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. 
All right, we will move to um, new business 6.2 to here and end of the year, fiscal year 18 operating budget closeout forecast and act as appropriate. So John, are you taking that? Uh, yeah. All right, you're on. So the, um, this is a, a, a budget update and forecast for the end of, um, up to the end of fiscal 18. And um, basically with the forecast, what we did is, is of Ma uh, May 31st, took a snapshot of the numbers um, of what the budget looks like with all the spending. In addition to that, we have a number of encumbrances. And so you have the, the actual spending that take place plus the, the encumbrances of the money that's reserved. And then we review all those encumbrances and try to make our best determination of whether those will be spent as they're encumbered or reserved or whether they'll go up or whether they'll go down. And so we make a number of um, adjustments to the encumbered amounts in order to come to a, a, a forecast of what we believe spending will approximate by the end of the year. Um, even, you know, we have better information now than we did at mid-year. Um, simply because time has elapsed and we're closer, we get better payroll information. Um, we have more expenses in, so we're, we're in better um, shape. And um, but still, between now and the time the budget finally closes out in October, there still will be a lot of changes. So what I'm forecasting right now is basically a, 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 a even budget where. I'm showing a negative $17,000 after all the adjustments that we made, which at this point in time is, is basically a balanced budget. Um, the, as we proceed through the end of June, we'll have a number of other encumbrances that will sort of close out. We'll get, um, so that basically when an encumbrance closes out, what that means is that someone put a requisition in for a purchase. That purchase took place, but may not have taken place in total. Okay, could have taken place partially. Maybe it could not be fulfilled. Maybe the um, product changed. It was no longer available. Um, by the time the, the, um, <coughs> the vendor actually got the order and processed it, because lots of times they're planning these things well in advance, right? We, we, we did the budget for 19 and we started in October. So as they're coming through their budget numbers, they're getting quotes and, and all this information relative to what they think their plan is going to be for the next year. And then they issue the purchase order and something might have changed. Often happens in, in like, you know, for textbooks. Um, there's also supplies and materials that go on and they say, I'm gonna need all of these. But just because they say they're going to need all of these, I say buy those as you need them. So, you know, they get, Sometimes those orders get tempered down. There may be an open purchase order that says, I have $5,000 worth of supplies, but not $5,000 comes in. Maybe, you know, $2,500 or $3,000 or $4,500. There's a 525 accounts, and any account, most accounts have purchase orders against them. If, if, the, if the accounts don't have anything against them, I don't see it on my list of 525. Everything in that 525 has some monies. The chart of accounts has more than 525 accounts. So I just go through that to sort of give you an idea of how the forecast is actually put together, okay? So you look at, you know, if you think, it, picture it as three columns. One column is, is what your budget is. The other is the actual year-to-date expended. And the, the next one is the um, encumbered funds, or the reserve funds. And, of course, the net of those equals what your available balance is. So, um, looking through the budget, there's um, the we're just about even, and you know for the highlights, what what I see is you know there's some significant overspending in special education, um, significant overspending in maintenance, and significant overspending in heat. Um, but some of the heat was sort of offset by electricity. Now, the um, Special education, two, two lines particularly. One is um, the instruction was up 231, which is primarily contract services. And then also special education transportation was uh, over budget by 232. And that's largely a function of um, um, really under budgeting over the past couple of years. I've under budgeted that number. And um, you know, actually this year we've increased it to try to like catch up some of that gap um, and so the, um, now there's, there's, it's just really a function of being on the budget. 
maintenance. We would do all our uh, maintenance projects, um, the winter spending, the repairs. We might have, you know, um, items such as the, the netting at the high school or a boiler may break down that's sort of not budgeted for and we're not using capital funds for it. Um, and then with the heat, you know, we, if you would call back in January, we had a real killer couple of months. It was a very, very cold winter. So our heat in terms of our natural gas bills um, actually were significantly overspent. But we did benefit a little bit from the electricity. Um, during the budget process, you may have recalled, Mary said, I think your electricity is still high. But I didn't have any good information on the electricity. I think as the years progress now, what I see in electricity is we do benefit from most of the schools, except for Plymouth River is much, much higher. And I think that's a function of the way the new rate structure actually goes is the demand index. And since Plymouth River is an all-electric school, their demand spikes are always going to be there because it's electric and that actually raised their bill. But, um, you know, with the benefit of electricity, we, we did um, um, the, the offset for the overspending in heat or total utilities was, was somewhat minimized. Um, the summary that every, you have, if, you know, in the summary there's what we have as our basic budget structure and for the large items that appear there, I put a little notation um, to, so you can see you know, where the overspending is. One thing to note when you look at this um, information is that in the budget there was a very large allowance for collective bargaining agreements. Those monies have now actually <coughs> flowed into the individual departments, will, which will basically show them as a negative variance to the budget. But there is a big offset in the budget in this sheet where you see a positive variance for that allowance. It's just, it's just not practical or possible really for a forecast to sort of move that money into the appropriate buckets and, and be anywhere near reasonably, um, you know, figured out on where the spending might be. <coughs> um, the, back in um, February when we did the first forecast, I did see, you know, as we did the, the, the um, forecast, we noticed it was negative back then as well. Okay, so what I did this year was I sort of closed purchase orders earlier, about a month earlier, and I basically put a message out to the field saying, you know, close all your purchase orders, get them all in. You know, it would be essential spending only. If anybody needs anything, then, you know, contact me or sort of ask me before you would do that. That spending typically would relate um, to the, the field. It can't really relate to maintenance because if something breaks, you have to get it fixed. It can't really relate to special education spending because if you have to provide the service, you have to provide the service. Um, although we still watch all the things, but we really don't do anything that's sort of discretionary. So I think that actually helped us pull back a little bit so that we could, you know, have reserve, not reserve funds, but make up for the deficit that might have occurred if we continued spending it at that pace. And so as you go through a number of these items, and I'm happy to answer questions about anyone or talk about anyone, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go through the individual ones, you know, right now or else I'll keep you here for mm. about another hour and um, everybody's eyes will glaze over eventually. But um, I'm happy to, you know, so you, I did get this in Friday, so hopefully people had a chance to take a look at it. I'm happy to answer any questions um, about the individual details. Okay. And um, the other thing, too, is I, I might say that, so we, as we close out the year, some of those purchase orders will drop off. I see a negative right now, but I'm really not worried about it because I do believe those purchase orders will, will drop off. I believe some funds will become available. I don't think they're going to be really significant large items where the school committee would say, oh, let's go do this $50,000 or $60,000 project or let's do this project. I don't think there's any of those out there that we can say with confidence at this point right now. Um, however, um, when we were when we were doing the budget for capital this year, long range planning committee, we had we started with a list of about $2.2 million worth of stuff. We worked it down to about 1.3 before we 
brought it to the capital outlay committee and when we got it down to that 1.3 we actually identified a number of projects that we said well maybe we could use year-end funds for that okay and I provided in the detail for this packet a few of those projects that could possibly be done if some of that money drops to the bottom and we have it available also we were talking about like HTSS they have some supply materials we, we deferred that from this year's budget saying we can do that with end of year funds so I think that you know if monies do develop between now and the end of the year that they they certainly should be used for the HTSS because we expected anything we deferred you know it took out of the 19 budget to be done through end of year funds and then as an alternative the committee could decide to do one or more of the long-range planning um, ones or um, you know the, the a, as options All right. I do I think Carrie and myself and Liza had some particular questions about some of the special ed okay. costs but we could also I was thinking we could do maybe a deeper dive at our special ed subcommittee meeting which is next Tuesday on some of those if but I mean we could certainly talk about them now too but I might send you some sure. other information that we might want to have. But do you have questions you want to ask now, Carrie, or anyone? Well, I, I just, uh, just one. We, sort of order. You, thank you for, as we were emailing sure. today, because I had some questions. Um, the contract services, it's a, in your memo, it says it was up $390,000 for, uh, for special ed, um, and then it was offset by some para um, and teacher savings. So is that was that also over budgeting or, or under budgeting sorry that it was up that much no that no the the contract services um, that those are um, so they you know there's a, there's a number of them that like ABA services or we you know we may need um, they, they could be a para um, services there's home instruction there's uh, specialized services um, was up then there's language services specialized equipment home hospital uh, tutors mm -hmm. and also then is um, a contract that we have for ABA services so those were just the, the um, in any given year those can just fluctuate based on the services that are actually needed mm -hmm. we have a budget of about five hundred thousand dollars and two hundred and ten thousand dollars of that is sort of offset in by the IDA grant mm -hmm. okay so um, you know, you see a net in the budget of about three hundred thousand, but this is on top of that. So um, it just is. There's there's a bunch of details that I have on the list and stuff, and they it, it's they just the services that were needed for this year. For this year, yeah. do you expect do you expect them to keep going up? Um, I'm not sure, Terry. Mm -hmm. I think I think it's it's a it's one of those um, they they I think they can be altered because special ed is just very fluid sometimes services are needed sometimes they take back sometimes they're you know there's there's a lot of um, things that get done that doesn't say there's nothing that says that will be consistently spending at that level if this is just all special ed is sort of a point in time and, and what you have for a mix and what services are actually needed mm -hmm. um, you know and it, it doesn't really have to do with tuitions it's Right. It's really, you know, the actual services. Yeah. So I think it would be good to take a deep dive in that in the yep. meeting. Okay. Okay. I, was, I was saying to uh, Carrie earlier that I think what will help is for us to have a discussion and, and at the subcommittee would be a good place to have the, a discussion about the contracted services and what that um, is made up of. And some of it is spending that we know in advance that we're going to, to need. For example, in the area of speech language, uh, we have a number of uh, staff employees who are speech language. We have one school that doesn't have a staff member for that service, but we contract for the whole year in advance for that. So there's a contracted service we know in advance, we budget for it, we know who it's going to be, and we plan ahead. But if you take the area of ABA, for example, <coughs> we have a staff person, we budget certain other ser services that we know we're going to need, but then there can be a student who moves in or there can be a greater need for hours as IEPs might be uh, revised during the year, or amendments, that kind of thing. So when those costs pop, pop up, we can look to the IDEA grant knowing that they may be different from year to year, but there's a, there's a place to go 
typically we know when we start the year how many um, uh, one-to-one powers we will need. That's uh, spelled out in students' IEP plans, but those plans can change over the course of the year, and we need to have somewhere to go. And that's why I always say that, that whatever the, uh, the students need, we are responsible <coughs> for um, But since we don't always know in advance what those needs are, uh, having a, um, a grant like IDEA where some of it is totally mapped out at the beginning of the year is great, but having in those categories additional funding for contracted services that could be a para in one year and could be additional ABA hours in another or home services in another is really important uh, to us. But I think that it's not something that we map out. What you see in the budget every year is the offset and you never see what it's made up of. But we can go back and look at individual paras and be able to quantify more how much of it, for example, in the current year is going to ABA, how much of it is going to speech language, and, and uh, particularly at this point in the year. So I think that's not something that we've ever done is to take a serious look at at the, the whole grant and it amounts to 900,000 to a million and see what it looks like and I think it's a great topic for a uh, subcommittee meeting. Yeah, I, th I yeah. think it would be really helpful if, and if there's any way of anticipating what age the student is and as they matriculate up and is there some, any type of projection because with a gap of this size anything we can do to mitigate a potential gap in the future I think will help. It's very unpredictable but well, I mean, we know who our kids are, and they're, yeah. it's in their IEPs, and we'll take a, take a look. It's good you're here. <laughs> um, and I, 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 we can take a look, and it, maybe the contracted services are the best way to go, but maybe right. it might make sense to have another, an additional BCBA in yep. district. Or So it's, it's we have to get a good understanding of what we're paying for and how we're paying for it yeah. um, to see if it's appropriate. I agree that, you know, it may be cheaper to... Even though I know the town is concerned about adding personnel, but it may be more cost effective right. and better for the student to have a consistent provider than always so contracting. Yeah. You hear us say often when we build a budget, we're recommending a whatever it might be, uh, an additional person, and this was funded in a prior year by um, yeah. by the grant. Yeah. So that does happen from time to time. But when it's something that we don't know is going to continue from one year to the next and we might need yeah. speech and language one year and two more pairs in another, um, we wouldn't make that decision, but, but we certainly have. I wonder, John, is there any kind of, um, is there like a forecast model that you know of that you can use for forecasting these types of expenses? Like if you, if you know what your population is and as they go through, are you aware of anything like that? Because if not, I'm going to yeah. try to find out. I'm really not aware. Not, okay. not one for special ed. I mean, you know, we in, in forecast, I mean, personnel we schedule out. Right. You know, this is. Uh, but when the things come out of the IEP service. process, <coughs> which is where many of these things come from, mm -hmm. that can change within a year, let alone from a year. Right. You know, we schedule transportation out too, right? So we know they're, they're not in transportation. So now that's that's over budget too, right? And it's still fully encumbered. But what we do know is that between, by when we, when we put the encumbrance in, we take the schedule, we put it by the number of days that's scheduled, and that's the total encumbrance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we know that some of the attendance has not been there. We've reduced the encumbrance somewhat to sort of account for that. But by the time the end of the year rolls along, there'll be even more, yeah, you know, and say that, that cutoff, that cutoff may be okay. We, you know, that's not, the numbers are of the May 31st, but we may know where all the attendance is that may go back to April, okay, or, you know, April 1st or something like that. So we may have three months of attendance from transportation and, you know, uh, students not attending, and we don't pay if they don't attend. So those encumbrances may come down more it's just that from sitting in this seat at this moment, I can't tell you that. And I can't say that money will absolutely be available. But that's what happens at the end of the year when the encumbrances get reduced. When you finally get closer, you sort of know what the total spending is going to be. 
um, you know, we'll get the final bills from the vendors. We'll find out when all the students were there and, um, you know, in what days in the records from the schools and find out what days we should be paying for transportation. So that it's over 232 now, but it may come down a little bit. Um, just like a lot of those supply lines or the other individual lines, they may drop by $200, $500, or $1,000. Um, you know, and it's, give it's gonna, it, it will drop. I feel confident that it will drop, and that's why I'm negative now, so I'm not really concerned about it. And some of the transportation costs can be impacted by just a single student, a single change in student, because we can pay up to three hundred dollars a day in too, transportation yeah. for certain uh, schools, depending upon where yeah, they where they are. So three hundred dollars a day, even for a school year yeah, program that's, that's of one hundred eighty-five days, yeah. let's say, right. that's a lot of money, and you wouldn't think of that as uh, uh, making it that big a difference. It wouldn't take many changes to have that occur. All right. Does anybody else have any? Other questions on the budget? Did you have anything for long range planning, capital budgets, Ed or Carlos? Okay. Not tonight. Okay. Um, so, nothing to act on tonight regarding this. No, nothing budget. to act okay. on. The, uh, you know, you, unless you want to you could build, a, say, a consensus mm -hmm. about HTSS or, you know, the other project should some money develop. You know, because then. Um, you know, the, the other projects that um, Long Range Plan, and, and I'm not sure if Long Range Plan and members could um, speak if they would like, but, you know, the uh, safety access door from the back garden for PRS, shades for the first floor um, for the sun glare at the middle school, um, replace accordion walls with permanent structures at, H uh, at, at PRS, and, um, uh, a portable floor overlay for the auditorium at the high school um, and synchronized clocks for PRS and actually building 119, uh, building um, uh, 179 has a loading dock that should be sort of repaved that's falling apart. You know, that's a total of about $58,000 and I think we would prioritize those um, based on, you know, what type of available funds we have. John, how much are you thinking of for the HTSS materials? What, what I mean, we're talking we about buying the the uh, teacher materials? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, yeah. I I know what what it is, but right. what dollar figure are you looking at? Yeah, you know, I, I thought that was fifty two hundred dollars, but yes, I thought there were a couple of that. I thought there were a couple of other like one timers that were in that budget that I just could not recall. Um, Friday when I was writing this, and I would yeah. I did did all of this Friday, so I did, don't have, you know, every one of those items, but there might be a few items from that we should buy this year to support next year's budget. But I think the HTSS, like that one specifically, I do remember, and I think it was about $5,200. I, I personally would like to look at it at the next meeting, so maybe you, you'll have a closer sense and... Yeah, we probably we won't be able to get the projects going. I mean, you know, yeah. actually, we might be able to get a couple of them encumbered. So yeah. we could do that. And that gives you enough time to get what we need by the closeout of the books. Well, the it's well, it's it, it makes it harder to if money develops. It makes it harder to spend the money because you're too close, to, you know, very close to the end, and you know, there's other work to be done, you know, versus they could. As soon as you sort of know, okay, hey, this has dropped off, or like, you know, we're working with maintenance now, saying, you, see, maintenance has a lot of <coughs> open purchase orders as well, okay? Then their purchase orders, they open purchase orders, and then they tend to do purchase orders as they do projects. They open the purchase orders and get those approved because they need authorization to do a purchase. So we do an open purchase order. That gives them the ability to, like, call in a vendor immediately when we need something because they can't wait a week between the time they may need a repair and get in a vendor, right? They have to get the work done. So we open open purchase orders to be at the start of the year. So they have the authorization to call the vendor in. And then as the project gets, um, when they get the vendor in and get the quote, they'll, they may issue another purchase order. So sometimes we get a little bit overstated in, in maintenance purchase orders. Um, so we're in the process of closing those out, even though we've closed a lot out already. Mm -hmm. But um, 
there's you know there's millions of dollars being spent so it's you know, you, you, it's it's not like uh, you're not with a little accounting pad and you're like making oh, yeah. tech. You know, there's not somebody there to do it. Right. Hey, it's five dollars here. It's hundred dollars here. You know, right? Um, it's done at a much larger, um, higher level. So, it, so the oh, the so only point is, is that the closer we get to, to the, huh? What are you asking them to do? It's so unclear. Right. So, to the to the extent, I mean, if you, the I know you want another readout, but I mean, if you maybe would prioritize a couple of these, and then I could give you a readout, that could be helpful. You know, like with HTSS, if you if the, you could say yes to HTSS, and then if any of these projects you like, then we could do them. Otherwise, we can wait till the 18th. All right. And we and we may or may not. Then, you know. Well, I would say my first priority would be the HTSS materials, and then my only project on this capital list is the since it's a safety issue and we've been talking about safety um, is the access door for the staff room to the back garden at Plymouth River if that is real a need of making sure the building is safe exit access in an in an emergency if that's the safety that's um, being noted that that's that's what was that was what was noted. I mean, you know, and I, I would ask the long range planning committee too if, if, you know, they would agree. That's my personal, my two priorities, but not fair. Got subject to available funds and an amount up to. The HTSS thought is from the operating budget, which at this point is balanced or. Well, it's balanced because minimum. we deferred the HTSS expenditure to be managed hopefully at the end of the year but the so. five items in one two three four the six items in prior they're they're on a, they're the capital side correct um well they they're on they were on the capital ed and if you recall we deferred them college yep. we, we say you know let's take those off the list and let's throw them on the separate list so i just brought up this i just looked into the long-range plan and i brought up the separate list to to suggest that that may be an option for spending yep. um you know with that. the you know as we, when we were talking about capital so the um, I don't think we I don't even think we have them in the budget anymore I thought we dropped them out of the budget or we may have deferred them a couple of years <coughs> and we put them on this list so so what would we want to do here um, or does anyone else have any other items that they want to prioritize or is everyone sort of agreement that HTSS. Everyone, yes, agreement on. Can you explain what HTSS is, please? Oh, sure. I can. That would be easy, yeah, Michelle. Sure. Um, so, uh, part of uh, next year's budget was the rollout of a multi-tiered model of social emotional supports for all of our students uh, in pre in pre-K through twelfth grade. In the budget development, we made a total request of. Um, X dollars, and I'm, uh, I apologize, I, I wasn't prepared for this comment. About, look at these two. About 35,000, um, which we couldn't, um, in order to balance the budget, we looked more closely at that request and looked at those items which were one time dollars, right, that we could spend X amount and have them versus ongoing annual costs that would have to really be represented in the ongoing operating budget. So, there, to the tune of roughly 5,000 and change, um, are, are what we need for the fall, uh, which we sort of in terms of balancing next year's budget, um, committed to buying with surplus funds this year, um, those materials that would support the rollout for next year, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It was a little unclear, but that's, it's that more of the teacher kits and materials that would be a one-time purchase, right, that we could buy this year with any surplus funds from the operating budget, which we cut to balance next year's operating budget. And then my next question is, where do these priorities come from already? The, the end of year priority, one, two, three, four, five, six? When, when we were looking at capital with the long range planning subcommittee, there's, we had a, a big list of capital items and these were items were on uh, the capital list to actually request from the town, but we had to continuously pare that list down because sure. we started at two million. And at that time, you prioritized them. At that time, we pulled these projects out, and we stuck a 
priority number okay. beside them as possible as possible projects that if we had end of year funds that we we may bring forth to the committee so I'm just resurfacing them that's all so the committee actually already prioritized the long-range planning long-range planning subcommittee already apologies prioritized. Did. already pr prioritized yeah. the yeah that's right and we can discuss this a little more further tomorrow at the meeting sure and you know <coughs> John, I have one other budget question. Mm -hmm. um, the is has there been any thought to the money that the schools received from the cannons, the sixty five hundred dollars of where that's going? Um, I haven't seen the check. I, the band, I would okay. Yeah, I would think. Um, I so know that once we get the check, then we can. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if, if it's an athletic gift, I would be inclined to put it in the athletics gift account so that it could be used for, you know, repurchasing, purchasing athletic, uh, you know, we, we that, that account, we sort of like when we sold those sales boats, we put that into the athletics gift account, okay, so that when the PTO or the boosters for sailing bought a boat, we could contribute those funds back to the boat because the boats were bought by gifts to begin with. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's a town asset, we wouldn't do that. But um, you know, there's there's um, times when there's money to that are given for the athletic program, and as opposed to going into the athletic revolving account, which is used for operating, it can go into an athletic gift account, and it can be used for you know purchasing those types of assets that are you know for really gifts. We get a lot of gifts. You know, we had the pole vault that was a gift, and we had the, um, you know, the uh, the sailboats were a gift, and the row boats, uh, rowing boats, are gifts. So there's a, and actually, I think when we did the pole vault, I think that the gift wasn't enough, but there was money actually taken out of that gift account to sort of even subsidize that. There's not much in there. I mean, we're talking about a few thousand dollars. Is there any update on that one million dollars for Plymouth River um, as a result of the new buildings coming up? Uh, I, haven't, I haven't got any update on that. I think we, I think we should follow up on that to see if we. We if usually would talk about that at a forecast meeting when the forecast meetings would come up. Because I mean, it would be difficult to do anything with that now, anyways, Carlos. Yeah. You know. I mean that, that it, everything will come that's around that, again. That's something we should um, talk to the selectmen about because they've started construction there. That's right. And that's what we were waiting for, mm -hmm. for that right. development agreement to be Mr. implemented. Um, so maybe we can find out mm -hmm. from the town administrator. Maybe you guys can talk to Tom Mayo. That's that not good idea. has that development mm -hmm. agreement be been available. implemented? Yeah. Collect the money. Thank you for. All right, so do we have consensus that we want to, I don't know, appropriate's not the right word, I don't think, but that we're in support of purchasing the HDSS materials now, given to get that going? Yes, we are in consensus yes. for that? Okay, I don't think we need a formal vote or a motion. We do you need a formal vote? Do you need a formal no, vote? No, I don't think so. I okay. mean, it's not right. It's not a big item. I just, it's so that that's, I mean, okay. th that's good, so. Right. Yeah, okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Anything else on the budget? No, that's yeah. it. Okay. Unless you have more questions. No, we're good. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, Six point <coughs> three to discuss leasing another bus for Metco and use and to act as appropriate. John, I think that's you as well. Yes. All right. So in in the packet, there's um, so we had talked about this during the budget mm -hmm. during the planning session. You know, idea of. Uh, trying to lease another bus so that we could take over the Metco run from first student. And you know that would result in um, a, a cost savings to us and also allow us more flexibility and, um, per, and, and in our opinion provide a much better service to our students as well, okay? Um, and you know, so we, along with that, we, we continue to talk about that. Andrew, even though he's leaving, <coughs> you know, he knew about yes, that. Yes. We've done a lot of, we've checked with Metco and we can, in fact, drop a bus. We've checked with Cohasset, and Cohasset is, in fact, interested in this idea as well. <coughs> it would be basically cost neutral to them, and they're happy to go along. And they even said, you know, if, if 
if things turn out to be a little more expensive, let us know and we may help out too because I think everybody will benefit from having the control of what that route is um, sitting with us. So we did get it. We got a quote from DATCO and I attached to that. I put that into the packet too. This quote, however, is really for a purchased bus. Okay, you know, similar to when we purchased the 22 buses with all the leases and the paperwork and the, you know, we're buying it and then they're going to take it back. Um, the, I, I really didn't want to do that. What I wanted to do was get, uh, take a, 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 le a lease right from DATCO so we didn't have to go through all that paperwork, which is, tends to be soon, sort of onerous and takes a lot of votes and a lot of time. And actually, even if we were to purchase a bus now, it would be, um, it wouldn't be delivered until September. But by the time we get through the process of doing approval, it could be even later. Um, so we're talking to them about leasing one of their used buses. Um, so we, we see a price here of fourteen thousand. The trouble is a leased bus, a leased use, a, a leased use. Excuse me, a leased used bus yes. will will cost more. So I mean, in my note, I said the fifty up to fifteen thousand dollars. But my guess is that it's going to probably be closer to 17,000, 17 to 20 range, um, which I think the economics for that still works because this economics is saying, you know, um, that we will have conservative savings of, say, $6,800. Um, but, and it is very conservative, I mean, with the fuel costs and the, the driver and the benefit add on and stuff. Um, it's it's really conservative so I think that you know rather than saying 15,000 I think that I'd, pr I'd prefer to have like up to eighteen thousand dollars to enter to do a bus lease I think that was uh, I think our athletic bus ran about fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars and um, Patrick just gave me this information this afternoon that they, they wanted more and I said you know why and they say well you're gonna put more miles on the bus and they said well we, there's no sign there's not no saying we're going to use that bus we just need another bus we have 22 buses and you know we wouldn't be using one single bus to do it we would be alternating the buses perhaps use one bus with low mileage one year you know take that put that onto a low route then take another bus for the next year so we're still working on the price but I think that I put 15,000 in my, you know, my request uh, not to exceed, but I'd like to increase that if the committee would allow um, us to increase it. And I do believe that I do do believe the estimate's conservative. I think that will achieve much better results than what this shows. But this shows a worst case scenario. So if you even if you went up to like the 20,000, the 6,000, we'd we'd still make 826 dollars. But I think we'll do better than that. So you, you would like authorization for up to 20,000? I would like that, yes. <coughs> um, I'll take well, uh, comments, questions. Question? Well, I, I just have a, uh, a thought, something that I've talked to several people in the room previously. W when we have the buses that do highway uh, travel. Uh, it, it seems to me that those buses, whether they're athletic trips or in this case dedicated trips in and out of Boston, those buses are going to be on the highways as opposed to coming down Gardner Street or making a turn onto Main Street in Hingham. And I, I would like to suggest that we seriously consider getting some of these buses equipped with seatbelts. Uh, John, you and I have talked about this. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for the newer members on the committee, the first first student, first the, the series of buses that we had from first student were not really equipped to be retrofitted with seat belts simply because the framing on the buses. But the buses that we have now are all ready to ready to be to be installed. So I'd, I'd like to I'd like us to think about having seat belts on on the appropriate buses um, and whether it means we have a dedicated bus well then figure out how we can have somebody in maintenance rotate those every month or so if, if you don't want to have a dedicated bus yeah well I, I, I mean you know I, I thought they'd mention that to me and I saw your email and I mean I think that 
if we were to try it, you know, for the Met, for the Metco bus, that that would not necessarily be a bad idea, you know, right. because it is on the, it is on the highway. Good place to and start. And so, you know, with these buses, so there's 33 seats on a bus. Okay, and each to outfit each one with a seatbelt is 100 bucks. So it's 3,300 dollars to outfit a bus. Okay, but if we were, you know, the cycling plan, it, you know, Patrick said, well, I could cycle these on a quarterly basis. I could cycle them on a monthly basis. You know, but the when you think about what we're doing to limit the mileage, they probably don't even have to be cycled on that type of basis. They could probably be cycled on a yearly basis. You know, if I'm doing 15,000 yeah. locally and the mic goes going to be 26,000. I could take one that one of our buses that's doing 8,000 now or 9,000 miles, say, okay, that's the Metco bus for next year. Then I could take that off and then I could cycle another one in, you know? So I don't think, Patrick would, t would talk about rotating quicker, but we could probably, we could probably manage it, um, you know, on an annual basis, except for there will be times when that bus goes in for repair. And then it would not be practical to, you know, take off those belts to move it into another to take the bus out to repair. So then there would be some times when they wouldn't be with seat belts. You know, but, uh, you know, by and large, I think that, I, I, I do think with the highway that it's not necessarily um, a bad idea, you know. I think that... It, what, what's a, what's a, a reasonable uh, thought on your part about the, 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 ma the maintenance? All buses, all equipment needs to be maintained. Uh, how often did the buses go in, and how often are they off? And how how long are they offline? Um, they well, we have 22, and yep. that's really we you know actually 23. 23. Because we have right. the athletic bus now. Yep. Okay, but at any given point in time, one's out for several days. <coughs> at least, at least several one's days. out for several days. Yeah, you know, because they'll go in for they're going in for oil changes, right? So it's gonna it's going to be offline. They'll go out for an oil change. They'll go out for inspection. I mean, it's, there is a, there's definitely a logistical, you know, transfer of getting a bus to a location. If, if you do have a problem, it could go out and it could go out for a week, okay? Because if we do stuff locally down with, um, um, down uh, right in Jackson Square. Uh, Allmate. Allmate. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, with Allmate. But if we have like a major repair that's sort of a vendor item, it ends up going to Norton to, um, to DATCO's location in Norton, because we have the five-year extended warranty on them. So sometimes there may be a problem with a sensor or a DEF thing, and that's a DATCO thing, because it's sort of like, pro it's not proprietary, but it's really a dealer type item. So that bus may have to go to Norton. And you know, that could be a, that could be a few days. If you'll pardon the bad pun. Sure. Since I'm hitting green lights, would we consider now leasing a new bus with seat belts and spending thirty-three hundred dollars in equipping a second bus. Well, then, they, so then you decide, like you know, with, I, I hear what you're saying, okay, but now who's going to be riding with the seatbelts, and where are you going to require it? You know, it just sort of, I, I, I do buy the Metco thing, um, but you know, locally, I, I'm not really in favor of seatbelts. Did, did know, Patrick give you any idea how long it, it, it's involved in taking and, and, and uh, re, uh, repurposing those from that bus to that bus? Um, I is saw that, is that something, is that a field installation? Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think that we could probably install them ourselves. Okay. I think our maintenance people could install them. Um, then that answers. But you know, it would take time. I mean, y if you lift up the seat, there's like clips. I don't know what the seat belt actually looks like, but you yeah. know, we, when we ask the question, they lift up the seat, say, "Yeah, it's framed for it." So I think what happens is you lift up the seat, the there's some clip-ons, and you know, you just have to make sure they're safely installed. So, John, uh, can you just explain again in terms of why we're not considering purchasing the bus instead of leasing? Well, a, a, a couple. Um, one reason is the the first buses went through the the um, a, a sort of a. a a lease, a five-year purchase lease, and it take, took a lot of approvals going through the selectmen, going through the town, you know, it was a, for, for a very uh, high amount of dollars, right? You know, um, and that, that whole process takes time, okay? okay? You know, plus it's, it's a little bit onerous. Plus the other thing, too, is, um, you know, we know that in three more years, we're going to do, probably do another lease. Our, our lease, current lease, is going to expire. 
I would like to wrap them all up in one lease instead of having like two different leases. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we have to close this one out. Now we have to close that one out. All of that tends to be, uh, you know, a lot of work. Plus, too, in some sense, my mind saying, I want to test this. I want to make sure this works. Um, so when I go out for the new one, I'm, I could do the 22 or, you know, but the athletics seems to be working, right? So most likely when we go out, we'll do 23. You know, if Metco works, we'll, when, when that comes back in, we'll do 24. You know, it is six of one, half dozen of the other. It just seems as though this would get us a bus immediately available for the start of the school year without having to go through a whole bunch of other town approvals, you know, on the item. Right, and it's, it's not a real high cost item, you know, and it, it should be a cost neutral item. Um, it cost neutral at a minimum, but you know my numbers here. I mean the pays are going to be pretty much pretty close. You know I think we do think it's going to be an eight-hour day, but the fuel is probably going to be better. The maintenance is probably going to be less. I mean you know there's the, the the benefits probably aren't really going to exist the way this says. Um, you know so I think that it's going to be more beneficial than what the cost analysis actually says. But I want to present the conservative picture. Right. Um, I like Ed's suggestion of the seatbelts. I think we should do it with one bus um, because even if that one bus is out for a couple of days, it's just we've never done it before. And so, you know, losing those couple of days for maintenance is good. Um, but I do think we should take this opportunity to try the seatbelts because I've heard the legislature, if they haven't already voted, they're going to be voting on requiring buses to have seatbelts. Sure. And I think this would be a really good experience for us to understand what the kids, how the kids handle yeah. the seatbelts. I think it's good for the highway. I mean, I really do. What does it take to retrofit the buses? I think there's a lot we can learn from this. And yes. it's a big safety factor for those kids. So yeah. if we can, and if we can rotate the bus on an annual basis, sure. I, I think that's, that's all yeah. positive. Um, I guess now my question would be, if we do this motion for up to 20,000 um, and we want to include the cost of the seat belts, do you think do we need to vote this at the next one until we get all the costs together, or would I this cover it, or you want to just do a supplemental vote later if you well, incur other costs? I, I think that I think that we could do, do the lease, and then I think you know for a set of seatbelts, we can. I mean, we we have budget money this year, you know, from you know this, the 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 buses of, you know, they're offsetting a lot of that negative uh, dollars. <coughs> but, you know, it's probably I think. I did the cost before. I think it's ninety-eight dollars per seat, so it's about a hundred dollars per seat. Um, and you know, with the thirty-three hundred dollars, we could wait a week and we could say, oh, "How's it going?" Okay, let's get a set of seat belts and then let's install them, and we would use that for the Metco bus. Because okay. I am, I am in favor of it for the highway. I think that it's not a bad idea for the highway. But you know, it does get into a little bit of a slippery slope because then you say, "Now the field trips, right?" But you know, so that's highway too. But this is every single day in and out. And I'm, um, you know, I think I think sure. it's a good yeah, idea, yeah, good idea try to try them. Yeah. And I know about the legislature. Um, you know, maybe it happens, maybe it isn't, because I think it's been there before. Yeah. But um, it's I it's think this is a good application yeah. and a good reason for them. Okay. Just for my clarification, how does the cost savings work with Cohasset since it's shared? Okay. And so what cost does Cohasset? Co incur out of all of this. Cohasset, it cohasset. <laughs> so the way the, our bus. Yeah, the way the Metco runs work today is we have two buses and we're shearing those buses, Cohasset and Hingham. We have a secondary where there's the middle school and the high school people come the students come together, both Cohasset and Hingham. And then we have the mm -hmm. elementary and in the morning the elementary students, the Cohasset and Hingham come together. And then Cohasset mm -hmm. gets um, uh, in the afternoon, both Hingham and Cohasset, we take our own bus back, okay? Um, and we did that because Cohasset changed their times a few years ago, and it cost us about another 10, 15 minutes for the kids, and our kids were already waiting a half an hour, and then they hit the highway, um, you know, at, at the wrong period of time, and now they're 
commute home is an hour and a half instead of you know what it would be now an hour um, plus they don't have have that wait time so the kids actually get to go home um, they get a better ride and they they don't have the waiting time here um, the other thing too and so and then we each pay for that piece okay but Cohasset and us we've always been in this together okay so you know we we said here's the grant we'll split all of these costs so each one of us are paying three hundred dollars in the afternoon for an afternoon bus and we're paying three hundred dollars for a morning run by doing this we'll have our just our single cost and Cohasset will pay us the 150 for the morning run as opposed to the you know paying for a student and that will help drive our costs down and you know it'll, it'll work together and it gives us the ability still in the afternoon we have our own bus if we want more flexibility with our kids so they want to stay for some family thing our bus can take them home a little bit later it just provides a whole lot more flexibility for us instead of being scheduled by first student all the time you know so the afternoon run for the Hingham kids which would be fewer kids because the Cohasset kids are not going back to Boston Correct. Uh, would be on the this bus with the seatbelts yes yeah. ah. well they'd be there in the morning too. yeah so yeah. so in the morning you picture we're leaving our depot we have to drive to Boston right okay and then we'll do the Boston run we'll drop our kids off we'll go to Cohasset drop them off the bus will go back to the depot and then you know it'll pick up um, pick up our kids at um, 2.30, 3 o'clock, get right to the highway, and, you know, and it'll be our driver as opposed to first student. Um, and the, Andrew, Andrew has talked about some service issues with first student. Um, I just think we, it, we'll have better service because it's our own service and we can kind of control it. And um, so they'll be on that seat belted bus both ways. Good. And then our bus driver has to get back here, yeah. right? So that's where the sort of the eight hours comes in, right? They have to drive there, they have to come back, then they got to drive, drive the kids back home, and then they got to get back. Uh, might be eight hours, might be a little less, but. Okay. I'm going to make a motion. Thank you. To allow the director of business and support services to enter a three-year bus lease with DATCO for an amount not to exceed twenty thousand dollars annually for three years for us to use pr primarily for the METCO run. Second. Second. I like the second. Great, thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? In case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. Um, well, we can have the seatbelt discussion in the discussion of the minutes. Sure. Or do we yeah. need to make a motion that amend the motion to including seatbelt? I was just gonna not not. Uh, I mean, I'll just we'll just we'll just do that. Operational, okay. we'll just do that. Okay, great. We'll, we'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get a set of belts, okay. and we'll get them installed. As part of the thing. No, okay. no big deal. All right, great. No, thank you. That is great. It's much be much better for the. The only other top thing that comes to my mind is do we need help <laughs> on how this is enforced? Thank you. actually wearing the seatbelts no. or no. anything like that. <laughs> no. Well, okay, we do have monitor. There's a monitor, you know, the mon the elementary bus has a monitor in the morning, um, and there's a monitor going back. So we can certainly make sure that they buckle up. Yeah. And the monitor, we can make that part of the monitor's responsibility. The monitor that we take in the morning is actually works in Cohasset. So that's a real good, that's a regular thing. She lives in Boston. We pick her up, and, you know, and she's been doing this for years. So... You know that's um, that's a good thing, and then we, our monitors we have to we have to get our own monitor, but we will absolutely well, make it part of their responsibility. And okay. also, this is such a wonderful thing to be doing, and the parents will be happy to hear it. I'm sure if you yeah. put the message out to the parents so that they can reinforce the kids. You will, oh, great now we have seatbelts. You will put them on. Right. Yeah. 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 Parents, that's that's a good thing. Right? Yes. They'll be happy to hear it. I think on the highway it's a good thing. You know, right. I mean, especially with this. I, this is a new venture for us, right? And we're yeah. going to the town yes. every day on yes. the highway, single every single day, the same group of kids. So I think it's I think it's a good um, it is a excellent. good experiment. And we are moving on. So <laughs> six point four, because my very short meeting tonight is getting very long. So six point four. Thank you. To receive a mid-cycle report of the superintendent's goals for 2017-2018.
So the, um, the cycle for the superintendent goes from the evaluation in the fall through uh, the coming fall from November, uh, last November until this coming October. And at that point, prior to the superintendent's evaluation, there will be an, another update as to where we are on these, uh, on these goals. There were five of these goals this year. And um, so I've given you some bullet points as to what's been uh, accomplished, um, the actions taken, um, and I, I'm not going to read over all of them, but I think we've made pretty good progress on, uh, on all fronts, and some of the goals are closer than, than others. Um, I would focus most on what next steps are remaining, um, at least of the things that were planned for the year. Um, so in goal number one, um, which was um, w working with uh, um, uh, Jamie and CPAC and so on to, to support the goals of this, the uh, Special Education Improvement Plan, which were numerous and was attending meetings and uh, presenting a, a, a budget at the time of uh, the budget presentations uh, for CPAC uh, especially. A separate budget that we um, lobbied pretty hard to get a uh, restoration of the circuit break of funds that were cut and while we still don't have the final 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 budget um, that we uh, we do expect that we're going to be at full funding of that which is a, a great thing and um, we've offered numerous uh, professional development and we uh, enhanced the website um, updated the Special Education Handbook and the 504 Handbook and all of those things are, are on the website. So the things that uh, are remaining, of course, are to finalize the hiring of uh, our new student services director and facilitate her transition. Um, to we're all looking forward to review and respond to preliminary findings from the middle school evaluator. We're going to hear about the steps that were taken um, in the Next week is the meeting. The week after, but that's not going to share results. No, right? this it's is just going right, to talk about right, the process. Right, really what clear. has been done, um, and to also, I've been doing some uh, some kind of independent uh, discussion. One of the things that was brought up as part of the workflow plan was uh, uh, an interest in doing more for students with language-based disabilities, um, and and uh, in particular, very small number of students that. Um, um, continue to have, whose parents continue to have interest in exploring some partnerships and uh, what, um, we had a meeting with a small group of parents and one of the things that came up was that they believed that we had kind of a richness of, of resources in the area, in particular with uh, schools like Landmark and Carroll, where we might look to get some ideas of things we could do that we're not now doing and research that's going on and so on. And at the time, um, we were told that uh, the Carroll School was looking for um, some schools to pilot a, a program they were working with and we called there immediately after hearing that and it turned out that they in fact do not have a um, need for a pilot um, person or school. Um, we also found subsequent to that process that Carroll will not, will not be a, um, a student M a DESE approved uh, school next year um, so that we would not, if a student were to go there, they're going to have a, a programs. They have two sites, um, but the, the local districts would not be able to fund um, students there. And so, in fact, they're exploring um, a whole new um, kind of programs called TCI, Cognitive um, co cognition intervention is a technology based uh, program but it's something worth looking at uh, not because it's going to um, uh, teach reading uh, or any um, subjects where there are language based um, issues in any different way but it's looking at ways to strengthen other skills that uh, the kids with learning based disabilities have so um, I'm continuing to follow that exploration uh, Carol will continue to operate as a school, and they have um, come up with some private funding sources that they can help fam families with. So I wouldn't want anyone to think that they are not going to continue, but they will not be authorized by the state. Um, and we, we do not have anyone 
anyone currently at Carroll, so we don't have to be concerned about the, a student finding a different place to go. But at the same time, when we were exploring um, uh, partnerships, um, I also came across a pilot program that's going on at Martha's Vineyard uh, Public Schools at the middle school there. And again, it's a, it's, it's a program that is specifically for students with language-based disabilities, but again, it's not focusing on their reading. It's really focused more on enhancing the many strengths that these children have. And there's a lot of research that shows they're very entrepreneurial. So this particular program, uh, which was funded by a grant um, uh, that was raised by a man in a swimming kind of a, a fundraiser, but anyway, he raised a grant that raised uh, 70 something thousand dollars to run this program over a two-year uh, period. And, and because we should be interested in what kinds of new things are, are out there, um, I actually have um, my, my partner in, uh, in research. It has a meeting with the, the man who uh, originated the program and the man who um, is, um, raised the money uh, to fund it um, in the next, I think it's the next, the 11th, whatever day the 11th is. So, so we're just continuing to explore these things. And the third thing is that, that um, I think that we uh, should uh, expand on and that I've talked to Jamie about is the um, outreach program that exists at Landmark. We've never uh, used that program. And there are lots of components of it. One is that they have a lot of uh, actual courses now that they offer, and they uh, offer credit for those courses for, for teachers who may be interested to take privately um, through Fitchburg State, so teachers can be motivated to take a course because they'll get credit. But they also have a program where there are some on-site uh, professional development that we can provide here through personnel from Landmark. And actually, I mentioned it uh, when we had the, uh, uh, the day that uh, uh, Suzanne came to town, and, um, and actually Brookline has used that kind of outreach. So that's a nice thing to know. So, so those are just three things that you know, I'm going to continue to explore, and maybe next year we'll look for some other things. And, and we'll make some decisions about the extent to which these could be things that we suggest to parent for their own interest level, or these may be programs that um, we might want to become involved with in a different way, perhaps uh, as the one particularly at Martha's Vineyard, whether that they are looking for some pilot schools for that particular program. It would not take the place of <coughs> learning, literacy, learning, and improvement. But they're, programs that focus on the same target group of kids, but in looking at, in both cases, looking to strengthen the strengths that those kids uh, also have. So the second um, goal is uh, working with the school building uh, committee, which we did, to meet all the uh, MSBA uh, requests and requirements to submit a new uh, SOI. We did submit that uh, by the, the uh, date of August 6th, I believe that it was, and, and we're waiting to, to hear what's going to be uh, going on there. So it's a, it's a wait and see kind of thing. There are a lot of steps we had to go through and sign offs in order to get um, uh, that done, but it has been done. And um, I got a, about a week and a half ago, I got a draft report from the demographer now, we had the demographer that we hired, which is NESDEC, uh, come to Hingham uh, back in March and give a report to the building committee that was simply based upon what would happen if we move existing students in Hingham forward a grade and do that over a 10-year period and, and make a guest in each year of what the kindergarten, kindergarten, incoming kindergarten would be. And so the result of doing that uh, calculation was that um, projections look pretty even to what we now have moving forward, with peaks moving um, and larger uh, elementary classes coming through again, but pretty flat overall. But the demographer at that point only looked at history as projecting the future. They didn't look at the things that they now have considered, which are 
interviews with the town clerk to look at things like uh, birth rates in Hingham and, and nationally and where's that going over the next 10 years. Um, to meet with local realtors, they asked for a group of realtors and I gave them names of, of uh, realtors that had uh, individuals who had um, been in selling houses in Hingham for a long time because we're looking at trends and what's happened over time that can tell us something about the future. They met with the building commissioner and, uh, and the planning board administration to look at what uh, projects or building projects there are in addition to the two big ones that we know about and where they are in that process and of course they have they have templates and formulas for how many children would would be generated by a rental project with two bedroom condos uh, that might be gen uh, um, generated by a uh, small single house home um, purchase uh, project uh, and used those numbers on all of the projects that we have on the on the table and so now they've come up with a, a different um, thought about moving forward and it looks as if and this is preliminary because now uh, I'm going to ask that the building committee meet again and look at it and ask some other questions about what haven't we thought about what else might happen um, and that will then uh, generate a, a final a semi-final report I'll say and we hope that that will will have that before the end of the summer but then one of the things they've committed to uh, in their initial uh, bid uh, process is that they will then take our data from the October 1 report which is the official report for next year's enrollment so it really gives us the ability to to forecast another year out we said 10 years but uh, it'll be another year out and and then the final thing, which I don't think we're going to be ready to do yet, is to take that final report and use the data in it to populate the MSBA, what they call uh, enrollment tool. Um, the report will tell us all the steps they've taken and how they came up with the numbers and so on. MSBA doesn't necessarily want all that information. They simply want the, uh, the data that's generated. and so we will be at that point and probably not until we get the go-ahead to, to with MSBA. So we're waiting on MSBA, scheduling the building committee meeting, which I intend to do this week. And I say see goal five because goal five is really about the enrollment projection. Goal uh, two was about working with uh, MSBA to get that second SOI in. Goal three is the goal that we've had various titles for, but um, it, it's about this notion of, a, of what I call a common template um, that parents and students would use to interact with um, with the school in terms of what uh, what our homework assignments and what are long-term projects and all of that. So um, I did some initial data uh, collection. Some of it was around how did this notion ever get into the NIASC report? Because in the middle of, a, of things last fall, we heard a comment uh, about that coming from one of the, the um, uh, standards committee at the NIASC report. And in the report, I'm going to explain all of this more. But it's really interesting how something gets into a report that people then forget, you know what? I don't know how that got there. Well, I now know. I'll share that with you. It's not all that important. But um, I've met with uh, the leadership team um, folks, um, which includes all of the directors. Um, I've met with Katie and, uh, and Joe Andrews, um, Katie Karen Condon and Joe Andrews on a couple of occasions. We've done a survey of uh, all the teachers um, at the high school and all the teachers at the middle school to see what, uh, what uh, tools they use now. And at the middle school, predominantly, everybody is using Google classroom so that is kind of a common uh, platform some teachers also have uh, a website um, and uh, they have they, some of them use Edmodo but all of them use Google classroom the high school it's much more varied although I was surprised at how many teachers do use Google classroom I have met with uh, a group of students at the high school they were ninth and 11th graders because we had to schedule meetings around MCAS and uh, to pick their brains and get their thoughts. Um, I'll include that information in the report. We talked a bit at Community Outreach about uh, 
at one point I wanted to bring together a forum of parents, but then when we were doing the survey, the stacker survey, I thought, gosh, people are going to be over, you know, subscribed, so maybe we can put uh, a question in the stacker survey that would be about that notion. And then we discarded that idea because we thought we couldn't find the right language to be assured that parents would know what we're talking about. And so we said, uh, we'll monitor what the parents say at the forums and maybe there's some feedback there. I went to one it of the forums. It came up at the one I went to. Hmm? It came up at the, the focus group. Yeah, I think I went to. I went to the very first one and actually uh, Kerry was there and we talked about it some there and then I poked my head in at two others which were not very well attended but I'm going to try to pick up some ideas from the other one. So, so we've done a lot of, uh, a lot of research and um, I don't know what the result is going to be, whether we'll make a change or whether there's an evolution of change already beginning. Um, I was very surprised to hear that different departments like different tools for different reasons. You know, the foreign language <coughs> department <coughs> likes Schoology. Schoology, and that's because of uh, the ability to use the videos and that kind of thing. And well, the, the technology <coughs> Right. And I'll uh, tell you one thing that one of the students said. So I had about 24, 25 students, and they were they were very, very polite, but they had good opinions about things. And the, the one uh, young man that at the end, when I asked, did anybody have anything more they'd like to say, he said, well, it seems to me that mm -hmm. I have my preferences. I don't know what my parents' preferences are, but maybe they have. A, a preference. High school kids didn't seem to be as concerned about their parent preferences as, as the parents might be. But, uh, but he said, but in the end, I want the teacher to use what reflects the way they teach the best. So, so anyway, more to hear on that. And for, for this one, you will get a, a, a written report at the end and with recommendations if we have recommendations to make changes but I have a lot of data and I'll share that in the report as well. Dot just quickly on that are you also looking at how X2 fits into all of this? Um, yes because or not? there hmm? yes <laughs> yes I am because there is an option under X2 to do more communicating mm -hmm. about curriculum than we currently do. Okay. So. Um, the fourth goal was uh, getting ready for what, when we started, was going to be the coordinated program review. Uh, now it's called a tiered system of uh, monitoring, tiered focus monitoring. Um, we knew that there were going to be um, parts of it, a large part of it really related to special education, because that's always the case, and there were a few <coughs> more, um, sections, uh, standards, or criterion that were related to um, to civil rights, so that information we found out about maybe February, I think there was a training first, and then we got the information <coughs> that uh, about the um, standards detail would be coming, and it came in February, and all of the information needed to be submitted by uh, May 15th. On April 10th or 11th, but one Don't of those days just before <laughs> the break, we get information that now we uh, need to do some more uh, responses to um, the, the standards and the criterion in the areas of homelessness, foster children, and military families. And so that's fine. Um, big packet of things that we need to do, mostly Jamie um, needs to be submitting these things and I'm trying to help as I can. But uh, the point was that that information was due on June 1. Now, we were scrambling to get done the things for the first phase. And that we had four months of notice on, yeah, by the way. Yeah, and got those done. And now all of a sudden, before we even finished submitting those, this is other set of, uh, of information and that has to come in. So we are going to be working with permission to work however long we need to get it in because it just wasn't realistic and you know you might say well gosh how many how many children do we have that are in a homeless situation or that are foster children or that are military families and the answer is you know what very few 
However, the standards of the criterion and the, the, uh, the policies and procedures that you need in place and so on are just the same as if we had 100 children or 200 children in terms of the amount of work and getting ready. Now, all of this data gets to DESE in the summer. But we also found out that <laughs> we also responsible for ELL. Uh, so again, not a lot of pieces, but that likely is going to be a conference call kind of a process. Whether or not and when a team would come here, having reviewed over the summer everything that we sent, which all has gone electronically, we don't know yet. So hopefully in September we will know whether or not there will be people who will come uh, as they were with the coordinated review or not, because it is called tiered focus monitoring. We know what group we're in, and the group has determined we're in the group with all the other people who are going to have a coordinated program review in 1819. So that's our group, and that's group A. Um, but we don't yet know about the tiered part. And uh, we know that if you're placed in tier one or tier two, based upon your responses to date, we know um, that will seem to, the, the people in tier one and tier two are, are folks that are perceived to have a low risk of not being in compliance with the, in alignment with the standards. And three and four would suggest there are more problems, but we don't exactly know how you get into tier one, two, three, four. No, nobody else does either, obviously. So, so there's more to come on that, but um, as it always is, the preparation, which is a self-analysis or self-assessment year, is significant for these things. And I mentioned this a lot, just as an aside, last year when we were talking about doing so many different kinds of studies and analyses and all of that. This, this in itself is a big, is a big undertaking. So, 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 so far we're getting all of our materials in, and, and then we won't know anything until September. Anything more until. September. So, so that's uh, that's where we are. Um, and, and goal five is, of course, going back to the study itself, NESDEC study. So, we'll bring that to the school building committee, and then uh, we'll share it when it gets finalized. We'll share it with the school committee and the school building committee, and we'll update it in uh, in October, and um, and then we'll begin population of the in enrollment tool when we get to the point where we know something more firm about when this project can get underway. So that's where we are at the moment. Thank you very much. Does anybody have questions or anything on the second like report? All right, great. Thank you. Very you know, much. I did mention in the annotated agenda, not here, that, you know, so you always think we should have done more, we could have done more perhaps, but we had a lot of other things going on. and you know, included the two searches that were pretty comprehensive and and uh, a lot of kindergarten activity in November and December and, and January about the age at uh, entrance, which we hope to have uh, analyzed by August 1. So a lot's been going on. And, um, and I think if you look at the big picture, uh, the three of us anyway who are mentioned in a number of these goals have been pretty busy. And pretty shorthanded. And, yes, so. that is true as well. It keeps the job exciting, right? You never know what you're mm -hmm. going to walk into every morning. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Um, the next item on the agenda is 6.5 to receive notification of the appointment of Lance Mortland, custodian at PRS. So welcome to Lance Mortland. Um, and then Liza, sorry, you had included minutes from salary negotiations that's in the packet just for information tomorrow. purposes. No, okay. no, no, oh, for no, that's, that's tomorrow. just for okay. the tomorrow. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Then item seven. Any other items may not that were not reasonably known forty eight hours in advance? Anyone? No? Great. All right. Number eight, subcommittee and project reports. Um I'll go last. So do you want to Oh go uh, to for that? salary negotiations? Um, we're still waiting for a response from the bus drivers and transportation workers. We sent them a draft memorandum of agreement, so that should be coming to a close soon. And I just I put in the packet um, the agenda for tomorrow night. Um, so we'll talk about those 
uh, search consultants tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, do you have anything for um, policy? policy? No, um, thinking of doing a meeting in the next week or two. So okay. I'll be reaching out to the members of policy to right. organize that. And for community outreach also, the only update, uh, I think there's a little bit of confusion regarding our focus groups. So just for our listeners, the people that received actual invites from Stacker were, they took the survey and they actually said that they were interested in taking part in a focus group. So if you did not take the survey and you still want to partake, um, partake in a focus group, you can, and we will be having another session of focus groups on June 7th. You can go to our Facebook page and see the times offered and also on our website. We're still organizing, I think, focus groups with the students and with the teachers. Both will be Thursday. Students will be at 2.30 at Hingham High School or 2.40 at Hingham High School. And teachers will be at 4 o'clock here. And there'll be notif the, the, the notices are going out uh, to the faculty tomorrow morning. We had, we had a little scheduling with uh, Alexa and we, but we got it done. So right now there's not a meeting scheduled for community outreach until we get all of those focus groups, I think completed okay great thank you um, Ed do you have any liaison reports or anything that you Say want? Again. and do you have any reports from liaisoning that you well, want to make? Or? yes yes and no um, for, for I always like to and have like to give update on the uh, activities of my friends on the South Shore special needs athletic partnership snap group but since I haven't been to the last few meetings due to medical conflicts and for years I've sat across at these meetings, the table from one of our new members on the school committee mm -hmm. who has attended the meetings lately. Let me just throw the ball down to Carrie and let her <laughs> do some uh, talking to the people at home. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to mention um, thanks to Liz O'Neill, the Assistant Director of Student Services, and um, a group of wonderful teachers who have volunteered. Um, they're going to help us out this year and just do kind of a special needs 101 training for our mentors um, that are coming on for the summer program um, to kind of teach them how do you some of the kids have iPads and assistive communication devices? That's going to be huge for, for them. And I think it's going to really help um, both the mentors and the kids have a better experience this summer. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of them for all of their work on that. And that's um, coming up in June 13th. So. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Carlos, long range planning? Long range planning is meeting tomorrow. Okay. 430 PM. Here? Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Libby, do you have anything from any liaison things? You probably haven't had anything yet. No, that's <coughs> um, special Ed Subcommittee is meeting next. I've just sent uh, Pam the agenda, but we're gonna meeting next Tuesday, June 12th, 6 to 7 here, um, just before the um, CPAC meeting. So we'll meet here. Um, all right, that's it for subject and project reports. I will take a just motion just a, to it. I just noticed a, a bit of a typo on the next school committee meeting, I think, is oh. June 18th at 7.30. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to July 23rd. Oh. Yes. Thank you. He's <laughs> 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 already skipping ahead to the yeah. summer. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it definitely is June 18th. <laughs> so be June 18th. Thank, Thank you, Ed, for <laughs> catching that. And actually, the July 23rd one will be at 7 p.m. <laughs> but, okay. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. Good catch. I said to him, last meeting till July. He's like, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought it was. Oh, uh, you're like, yeah. <laughs> so could we clarify the CPAC right. meeting? Right. I had thought it was the 13th. I think they moved it. They moved it to 12th. the 12th. Yeah, they had to move it to the 12th. Well. Okay. Well, will it still be here? Because the region was going to be here rather than the library. The library was... <laughs> The library is still booked. Yeah, the library is still booked, so I think okay. we can change nights. And once we get through schedule conflicts moving forward, we'll have a consistent night. Okay, so, so this is still available, yes. but it's Tuesday, not. Okay, thank you. And seven? I think so. I will confirm with, I'll okay. double check. Yeah, Tim had told me seven to nine. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that's the, the, the goal. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and special ed is at what time? Six o'clock. Six p.m. Okay, so thanks. Just prior to the meeting. Thank you. Okay, I'll make a motion to adjourn. And we'll accept that motion. So then second. second it. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Thank you.